dude, you're a guy that I've just been a fan of forever. I appreciate that, man. That's awesome. It was like the mammoth flip, dude. I literally blacked out. And then after, as I was landing, I was like, dude, it's done. I didn't even remember it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that Tomac will rise to the occasion no matter what era he raced in, no matter who else is on the starting gate. But I know that he will be able to figure it out and be there with him and challenge. It's going to be the RC Stewart battles. I'm at a gypsy. Now, if you've been following the podcast recently, you would know that we're on a massive health kick uh, as we get ready to take on World Vets at Glen Helen in November of 2023. Athletic Greens is not only an all-in-one formula that helps me just cover all my nutritional bases, uh, it's also the first healthy habit that I have uh, that starts every single day. AG1 is packed with 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients of the highest quality that are able to offer gut health support, mood support, can affect your energy each day and contribute to overall healthier looking hair and skin. Every now and again, you get these like uh, crazy days, like few days strung together, and then you sit down for the podcast, and I'm like, oh, finally, some <laughs> peace, like I just get to sit, chill, talk to an epic human, and, uh, and get a I few hours that. of like guaranteed relaxation, and the last like, little bit has kind of like been that, you know? Dude, it's uh, yeah the easy part, right? This is the, this is what you're you're prepped to do, and then you get to just let yeah. it happen. Yeah, yeah. We got got reminded that uh, the sports that we like to do, we have to pay to play those sports. Absolutely, man. I always say it about uh, like mountain biking. Um, like yesterday on a trail ride in Laguna with a bunch of like a hundred people came out for a ride day, and and you you know you got to be quickly reminded that even just normal yeah. mountain biking, even though it's far far less than less dangerous than what we're normally doing or what i'm known for i guess it's yeah. still like pretty dang dangerous oh hell yeah yeah well like i had a buddy yesterday he's a good rider we just went to parlor he's about to do day in the dirt in what he was yeah and, yeah uh, he's like let's just get a tune-up ride in and then went to parlor caught by a big gust of wind he's not a heavy dude and it just like took him and he's 60 feet to the face and two broken ribs, broken hip fucking all day in the brutal i'm just like and the, it's crazy though like it was my wife's first experience she doesn't come from moto like at all like no kind of background there so it was her first like hospital experience to that kind of injury and she's just like man you guys are just chill and like i'm diagnosed i'm like you've broken your scaphoid like you've done this and the doctor's like do you have like medical background i'm like no like this is just a part of our deal so she she was like, it's actually crazy that just two regular dudes can have something so gnarly happen and it feels so kind of normal. Yeah, you get kind of trained for the injuries too. Yeah. You're you're accustomed to it. You remain to stay calm, stay calm and I and I, I treasure that, like the things that we've been unfortunately have to go through, but then you uh, you get better at crashing, you get better at dealing with all these these other forms of adversity besides just being on the bike, you know, moto and mountain bike alike, but I've uh I remember one time I actually broke my leg, uh, my tibia racing moto and a bunch of Amanda's friends that don't really know, you know, this is, you know, comes with the territory and any of the sports, like, what's he going to do? Like, yeah. as if I'm like done, there's no question asked. <laughs> and I'm like, this is like a minor yeah, hiccup. Good, yeah. I remember like it broke at the bottom of my knee brace. And I remember being like actually stoked because I had just come off of five years of ACLs every winter and and knee problems are the worst injury besides you know the the concussions and and any sort of like nerve damage and spinal cords or anything but like i think knees are the worst thing besides all that um so i was actually stoked that i broke yeah, my leg yeah. and they're like what is what wrong with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. i'm like this thing's gonna be healed in six weeks like my knee would take six months to a year so it's a it a different uh different mindset but at the same time i think it's cool that you've 
like you, we, it's like a brotherhood and you yeah. know, you know how to take, you know, you, you'd, you're riding with someone, you'd hope that they, especially if you're out on a long trail ride or something, you'd be hoping that they'll be able to take care of you as well as you feel comfortable taking care of them. Oh, a hundred percent. And then like your daughter goes through her, you know, her own version of that as yeah. well today. It's just like, Hey, this is, you got to pay to play. Like Absolutely. you want to, you want to ride the bus, you got to pay the fare. And I've always thought that there's there's good lessons in it for life like i remember being a kid and you know broken wrists and broken legs and it's like i've found going through adult life that there's a because there's like a physical pain threshold but there's also like the mental pain like the mental stress that you've got to or the i guess the way you deal with the mental stress like you can just be like this ain't like what you said about your leg you know to a normal person quote unquote normal it's like this huge life-altering event and then for us it's like ah, oh, you know i've got some other injuries that'll give me some time to heal and it's not really that bad like it where we get conditioned and we get ingrained that like it could always be worse and that you yeah. know you can you can end up dealing with pain that the quote unquote normal person kind of can't do yeah yeah and it's and you, you said the mental part i think that's the hardest like the, the physical pain can obviously be gnarly but it's it you know that that'll surpass uh, but the the mental side of being off the bike is worse than the physical injury itself you know yeah. like the just being off the bike is one of the hardest things you know especially because our whole life is is focused on this in one way or another and then you add in it being a career like this is how i feed my family this is how you know this is also the way i want my kids to grow up and and be able to overcome fear Mm. and go for what they want you know and and being able to compartmentalize the fear to some degree and not let it deter you from what you want so i mean you factor in all these things to lead by example and and then when you're when you're off the bike you start to kind of spin out of control like can't handle this. I feel like it's been a year and it's been a couple of weeks, you know? So you get, you get better at it, but the mental side of it and then overcoming it, when am I going to come back? Am I going to be just as strong? And, you know, and, and then the hunger sets in and you usually do come back stronger, but it's, yeah, the mental side trumps the, the physical pain, you know, tenfold. Yeah. And I think that there's something to, once you overcome something once, yeah. you kind of have a blueprint forever like yeah. it's the same it might be a different injury it might be a different circumstance like there's something's different about every situation but there's a certain blueprint of like you know what i actually did come back from that acl and i did xyz after it like there's always some kind of silver lining and then i think it just makes you maybe able to like take things on in a different way in your life in the future because you're you're not scared of if if something goes wrong, I'm going to have to overcome because like you've already overcome something before. It's like, I just apply that same mindset, that same lesson. And I, I feel like it kind of becomes a bit of a secret weapon in, in the arsenal of, you know, people in this world. Yeah. It's grit at its finest, right? I mean, yeah. that's how you, everyone, everyone has a plan till they get punched in the face, that famous Mike Tyson quote. And you just, yeah, you, you, you gotta, it, it'll, it'll weed the people out for sure. One, you know, that, that don't really want it. But then like you said that, that once you do it once you have that, you know, that's, that's another level, like a checkpoint in life that you're never going to go back. Yeah. Like true. it's almost like a racer winning their first race. I finally believe that I can. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And then that's that 1%, maybe 0.1% that's going to set the, the formerly top five rider up to be expected to be on the podium and winning. Um, so I think it's, yeah, you, you, you're kind of never coming back from that. Once you got it, you're like, I can do this, you know, it's just an injury and you're going to convey that to everyone else that you've ever been involved with for the rest of your life that goes through it and be there for them and give them the, the perspective, you know, that you can't, you can't buy, you can't really teach it, but you know, you're going to do your best to, to show so that makes someone else be able to overcome it as well. Oh, a hundred percent. It's like the, the community kind of building each other, you know, building up in, in every different direction. And I, yeah, I love that. I love, you know, you feel part of, you know, the action sports community in one, but then your specific sport, you're, you're part of it. You're part of the brotherhood. It's, I guess, you know, there's a lot of women involved in both the sports now, but it's, uh, you know, brotherhood just sounds cooler i guess i don't know <laughs> <laughs> no, i agree so uh dude you're a guy that i've just been a fan of forever like, i appreciate I, that I, man. that's awesome i don't know i don't know if to the extent that you know like my background but i grew up like a mountain bike kid i did dude i remember hearing uh the m1 uh, dude yep that was my i actually had a gt or, or a giant 
um, as my first downhill bike, but my real the, the my, red with like the the red, yellow, yellow and yeah, little pink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it was it, it was great bike, it was awesome. But when I got my first M1 when I was probably 15 or 6, that was my first down. Like I wanted to be Palmer, and that yep. was like that was the beginning of dude, all right. Palmer, Kavarik, run it like oh, dude, Vorys too. Yeah, man. yeah, yes. yeah unreal and then obviously looked up to ec a lot he's actually been a good yeah, friend dude. and he was my team manager on hyper for a little bit and uh there's i i didn't look up to ec as much for the lifestyle as much as kurt and palm or even kavarik and drifting and, and he, sam hill and, he was just a crazy competitor right? yeah and even lopes like lopes was kind of the bad guy to a lot of us you know but he but you dude, you cannot help but respect how much he could win and like an rc mentality it yeah. just yeah like just straight up like champion born and bred and works hard for it and then ec as well ec was a little more crafty did his pass in leger um that was one of the years i was in junior worlds racing and we're, we're the juniors didn't have four cross so we're sitting there just watching the pros and did the pass that he had to win was insane to hear hear him explain it was one of the coolest racing moments I've ever seen let alone in mountain biking you know so those are the everyone has their their own kind of accolade or strength uh, that you're you're drawn to but I mean for there was the two were were Voorhees and Palmer and Voorhees was like the original free racer yeah you know, yeah, like yeah. He's the he was you know bringing the BMX style to mountain biking and he had uh, the first to really do bar spins on a full suspension bike and tail whips. And as much as I don't really care about bar spins and tail whips, he, he's like, <laughs> back then, like it did mean something. Dude, right? He's pushing it. Yeah. He, and it, this, this is when the suspension sucked and no one had developed a shock to where it was really progressive. And if you're bottoming it out on nearly everything, but he paved the way, man. And then they, they showed us how, I don't know how cool mountain biking can be. You know, it wasn't just strict Lycra, you know, it was sick. Oh man, it was such a, it was such a cool era. And like, uh, there's a couple things that stick out for me, like a D2 Troy Lee helmet. Like I never owned one. Like one of my best, fr- like my best childhood friend growing up, he was like a really good BMX racer. And then if we like kind of raced mountain bikes together and he had the fucking dopest carbon blue flame TLD D2. That to me is like iconic. Yeah. The M1 is iconic. And you know what else I just loved? was the fifth element progressive oh, shock yeah, yeah. i never had, i had a fox that went in my m1 but like that that titanium spring yeah with that fifth element like oh bro like that just to me was just like the era and the troy lee gear that you know like everyone would wear back then like it was such a cool that's like 90 supercross that was that era is like the 90s supercross of downhill to yeah me. yeah i saw a picture of mc at uh at the like the tld store in laguna and we're just i was talking with troy about it and it's like this is this is what i know of motocross and everything that i was drawn to supercross was that right there yeah 1-800 yeah. collect like that era was the first time i really ever saw him but yeah for mountain biking I, the M1, hundred percent, like that was it. And then, but my dad, he, you know, we got deals from the bike shop when we're, we're sponsored and whatnot, but it's still expensive. But then he didn't want to buy a D3 or a D2 at the time. Um, I might, I don't think I was racing enough downhill to where I could have ever gotten the original Daytona, but one of the D2 so bad, uh, never got it. And I would, I would marker like racing stripes and try to do a TLD design on this, you know, kind of whack blank helmet I had. So my first D2 was actually like given to me and painted by Troy. Dude. And I was, I was either late 17 or early 18 year old. Um, and that was like been on him ever since. That's the only, you know, I've only worn TLD for, for almost 20 years now. They're going into this winter. It will be 20 years. Wow. Uh, and then on gear, um, which like a couple, I was on Oakley gear back then, but, uh, only a couple years after, but that was like literally what like you're saying that's all you wanted my goal in life in riding was to get a custom painted helmet you know like by yeah. by troy yeah and the first time we were able to sit down it, he was kind of rushed you know and i was like i'm still doing it and yeah, then, you know, yeah, then yeah. It, here we are i have every single helmet i've ever he's ever painted or designed and then the paint shop painted and those are my favorite pieces of art that i've ever had and I will always have them. And p- kids are always asking, can I get your helmet? Can I get your helmet? I'm like, I'll, no I'll, give you, I'll give you goggles, shoes, whatever you want, jerseys and stuff, but no way you're getting a helmet. Oh, it's so iconic. And 
I I met Troy. I I had like a couple of like meetings with Troy. Or like I met him a bunch of times when I was living here the first time. But we first properly hung out at the Le Mans Moto GP last year, and man. I just got, you know, when you can like meet somebody and you have like a four or five seconds where you're just like, I, I fully know you now. Yeah. <laughs> like in such a short period of time, like Moto2 had just come off the track and we kind of met through, we were actually at Alpine Stars and we got like prop, properly introduced and um, he was just like, oh, dude, I love your show. Uh, man, did you just see what happened? And just full froth for like Moto2 you know and i was like bro this is why i fucking loved your company and this is why you everything you ever made every helmet you ever painted like fully hit me was because of that like it, where it comes from in you and then since then i've hung out with him a bunch more times and i'm just like bro you're the fucking recipe like anyone that wants to have a successful company just look at Troy Lee, hang out with the dude for five minutes, look at what he's done. That is like a guy fully living from his passion and he has one of the coolest businesses in the world. Yeah, it's any any good brand, especially if your name's on is an extension of yourself, right? But that brand 100% is the artist that has a moto pedigree and lives in the moto industry, but bringing true art to it. But then also you sprinkle in Troy's attention span and just how, you know, he's yeah. just instantly just go, go, go to this and then forget about everything else and just focus like so focused on such a short attention span, but still focused in whatever direction he wants to go. And I think that speaks to how ridiculous some of the gear looks until you put it on. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. like the, so the new line will come out in some years and I'll be like, dude, that, what is this? And yeah. then as soon as you put it on, I'm like, oh. This is so oh, sick. Oh, he had it figured out. And that's the only <laughs> yeah. way you're going to try to really make a new trend. I'm sure it's, I'm not into high fashion, but I'm sure it's the same way, you know, unless unless one of the, you know, reputable designers are going to be putting their, you know, coming up with some crazy idea. It's just going to be bland, you know they have to like take the leap and this is what people are going to be wearing every yeah. year yeah it's like i i would always say you got to be a connoisseur of cool like you just, you just put it you just have to see what you like and be like okay i'm a connoisseur of cool i like this therefore it is cool and he's that guy to a t you know he's like he just doesn't give a fuck what anyone thinks it's like he's just an artist making art that he wants to that he wants to put out into the world but I think the thing that's so rare these days is, or not these days in general, is like you probably know people that are amazing artists, but they just can't get their shit together yeah. enough to like figure it out. You know, like I know people like that. He seemed to do whatever it took for him to make it a company and make it real and make like that is the something that's really special because to be that talented, to be that creative and that attention span, that like that's the fucking artist brain at work, you know? Yeah. So like he's figured out a way to wrangle that enough to where he can be like sporadic and prolific, but make it make money and make it make sense. Yeah, that's crazy hard to do. Yeah. It's well, especially it's, it's different people, right? Yeah. A lot of business, you have the alpha and the omega and you're at the, or the yin and the yang and they blend, you know, one runs the books and one run, you know, one's like getting investors and trying to run the numbers. The other one just creates, but he did, he was able to do it and i think it's more kind of a, a doing it on slow like getting rich slow kind of thing yep, you know yep. it, and i don't think it's ever been about the money for him but it's uh it's more of just growing slow and not trying to have this huge startup and all these investors and try yep. to be real top heavy and a lot of risk and uh it's it's been sustainable because he just grew it slowly and did it right and uh then you know Ever, you know, and now it's staple. Like it is, it's one of the all time brands in, in both sports. And I think mountain biking was the crazy part because he, he just, oh, we're going to do mountain biking just because. And then it started to gain some steam with people like Palmer and, and John Tomac and, and all these other just legends. But then uh, at some point, bike sales surpassed moto, you know? Yeah. So it's kind of cool to take over two sports with the same kind of idea or the, the same, you know, just art like put art first yeah. just make people like be a connoisseur cool the coolest looking helmets but then also making the safest helmets and yeah and and just looking after the riders it's uh yeah proud to be a part of it for 20 years now yeah that that is crazy and i think the the thing with him and why it's such an example is like 
exactly what you said. It wasn't about money. And he probably got into mountain biking because he thought Palmer was cool as fuck. Yeah. And then he thought Tomac was cool as fuck. Like, that's probably the business model. Like, that's probably the decision. I'd love to ask him, like, at some point he'll do this for sure. But it's like, that's probably all he was thinking. And again, it's like, when you're just so genuine, like, I just want to paint this guy the coolest helmet. I want to make him the coolest gear. He's cool to me. And it's like, look what comes out of that. It's just so genuine, so real. And it's like, he's just... Uh, and I think too, like, so he was at World Vets, right? So we did the race and I get to the start line for my first practice, 25, Lee on the back. And I'm like, of course, so like, sick. of course. Like, yeah. how did I even not think or why am I surprised that he's standing here on the start line? And and it's not like a publicity stunt, right? No. He's, he's just yeah. there. He's not. Yeah. I'm sure he didn't yeah. even post anything about it, you know, but yeah. he just lives and, and races moto and that's i'm so bummed i'm missing day in the dirt this year because that's been uh like that's one of my favorite parts of the year there and i missed mammoth as well for the first time in a long time but i dude i just love being able to do two moto races per year and and day in the dirt's always even easier because it's after my season i'm not worried about getting hurt or anything and even though it's a way more low-key race but i'll still do mammoth as long even as long as i'm competing in mountain biking because it's it's worth it i remember i remember palmer saying that about um race and moto when he was you know coming up for the olympics and it was you know that's like that's his life and that's all he's focused on he's he didn't think he's going to get another four-year shot uh, or another shot four years out and uh, someone kind of tried to keep him from keep him from racing moto, and it's like it is a part of my life. Like yeah. I not, don't want to don't really want to live life if it, if that's going to be removed from it. So I I feel the same way, and and I don't race moto much, but it is like I need it. I love it. It's like a huge part of who I am, um, and it influences mountain biking too. You know, yeah. I think it's the best cross training. It's the best. Uh, you get you get more seat time. You get a longer you know strength uh, you know stretch of focus, and. Yeah, like Albie Lair is a, a good friend now on, on oh, Maui. Oh, dope, yeah. Dude, and he loves mountain biking. And the and, and I read an interview, um, you know, because I ride with him, but I didn't really know why he was drawn to it. Uh, but he was saying it's it's like the the flow state yep. is just stretched out. Like think of how long your flow state is on a wave, even yep. if it's jaws or something. Like it's pretty quick, right? Yep. So to get that to be stretched out over four minutes is is – pretty incredible but then i think about moto and being that being stretched out over over 20 30 yeah yeah like mammoth it's like a i don't know seven probably like 20 minute moto probably by the time it's all said and done it's just like that was such a good 20 minutes of my life and so much like you know feeling and living just in that 20 minutes no matter how you do but do like yeah ripping a holy at mammoth is probably one of the favorite things that I've ever done in my life, you know, like <laughs> oh, nothing, yeah. nothing like that. Cause I didn't, I didn't race moto growing up. My dad wouldn't buy me a moto. Um, we didn't really have many friends that did it, but we got kind of ingrained in mountain biking pretty early. And that was like our family sport. You know, we, my brother and even my mom would come ride at North star sometimes. And that was the greatest thing we could do together. Yeah. My dad had really bad hips and stuff. Couldn't play baseball and, and things like that so like mountain biking was our sport and so it, it and who knows moto might have you know pulled some some of that time away which wouldn't have been the best so uh, when i was 20 and i was old enough to or and i could buy my my own moto because we you know i made peanuts for the first two years i was pro but um first chance i could bought a moto and that's been a huge part of my life ever since absolutely love it and i think yeah and i think it changed uh my riding mountain bikes for the better as well yeah i actually had that was going to be like one of my first questions is like i just i wasn't aware how deep you're in moto and then it was like a few months ago i saw you following the podcast and stuff and i was like no shit like i've been a fan of cam zinc for fucking legitimately 20 years you know like well i've been bit. a fan of the podcast since it's been around i just started following you on instagram at that point but i had been watching the show and listening to it for long before that yeah it's just like that, that you know there's a lot of those random ones where you're just like man that's crazy that you know that he's into not the podcast but just like moto in general i'm like i had no idea like if you're I guess if you're following this, it's like you're fucking deep in moto. You really want to hear some cool shit yeah. about it, you know? So, uh, yeah, I had no idea that, that it was that, or even that you like race mammoth and everything. I mean, you're, you're in. 
Yeah, I've got I've got a couple bears. I've never gotten a big no bear. Way. I've never gotten a big bear, but I've got yeah, I got a, got a couple small ones. But my buddy uh, Dom from from Maui, who I met after moving there, said he he was racing in your class oh. at, at Vet Worlds last week, and he was he was pretty pumped that to see you lining up as well. And but dude, it's a the, the community is everything. I mean, yeah. like some of my best friends have come from the moto track, and they wouldn't. I probably wouldn't be as good of friends with them be more like an acquaintance or you know you don't get to see him as often yeah, but moto really strengthens yeah. the bond yeah yeah the times just hanging out at the back of the van or what or the easy up or whatever in between motos and just you know washing your bikes together putting on fresh tires together just the whole experience of it is such a cool like friendship bond that you, yeah. you can't like I, I and it's hard yeah like you got i think there's something as well to going through a hard thing together mm-hmm. and like we can all relate like i think world vets was a cool thing with for that aspect is like my buddy franco came over who's our mechanic my dad was wrenching as well my mom was there my wife was there and they run the house for us and then it was like my best friend Azza, who he started riding later in life too and it's like he won he he's won it before he got third in the 45 um expert but it's like we were going through this hard thing together and we were like our hands are blistered and we're tired and like we're str- like not riding great the weeks the race is in a way and it's like there's something really cool about like coming together and like really working on it as a as a group you know well you're kind of making your own factory squad yeah. and, and having you know people are, are helping in different ways even though no one's paying anyone you're paying to be there but you're still kind of taking over those jobs that they would have in place for a real team and I just, it, I remember Brayton said at his retirement, the thing that he's going to miss the most is like the days of the test track. For sure. Like that is like having a team to work on a common goal when you're so passionate about it is like the sickest thing ever. That's like with, with Rampage, yeah. some of the best times of my life will always be up on the hill, especially in hindsight, because we're, you know, picking away sun up to sun down for, for days. 10 days and it sucks in the moment but at times but then we uh we did a mandatory beer break every every day this year um so <laughs> like the uh, the filmers aren't allowed to help help dig but luca cometti was was kyle's filmer and every day at five like four forty five, we're like i don't know he's not here and then sure enough right at five he'll come up the cliff and we'll just be like all right picks and shovels down and sit down and have a mandatory natty light you know, <laughs> before we get back to work and those out of those little things just or oh, remember that forever just sitting on the edges of the cliff working toward like the our super bowl you know our yeah. supercross finals you know that's like the biggest thing that we have in our sport and you know just putting in the work and and knowing that we're gonna have to overcome a lot more risk and adversity but then the yeah, just the the brotherhood up there is uh you know those all treasure treasure that forever. The thing uh the thing that I was saying I was actually on a on a ride of, it was at Mammoth actually so I went up there this year to to spectate. I I'll definitely race it next year, but I just kind of like didn't have enough organized, didn't have a bike here. Like I only got here a few weeks before. But we ended up um we ended up doing a couple cool trail rides and like we kind we had a really great mammoth experience like me Barrowman and Sheeran yeah. and like a couple of the boys and one of the boys in so we'd stopped and uh, and he just goes you know what's crazy about this ride boys if you gave me a billion dollars right now we couldn't make this moment better and it was that was like a profound statement like I that really like I spent a lot of time thinking about that and that's actually been something that I've like, I've been going back to mentally a lot lately is like that week with my brother and my dad and my wife and my best mates and like spending that week doing world bets. It's like someone could have put a billion dollars in my bank account and it wouldn't have made the experience any better. Like literally. And I I could have like, maybe I could have bought a couple extra tires and shit, but I already had enough money in my bank account to do what I needed to do. And it's like, Man, if you're in a moment in your life where if somebody, you know, especially in the world that we live in now, where like it just takes a lot to fucking survive, you know, but if someone could put a billion dollars in your bank account and for a week, it couldn't even improve your life, like you're doing something cool. And it it like really made me appreciate 
the moment when you can like wrap it in that context and i mean i bet it's the same thing at rampage like yeah. you can only use picks and shovels and you've got your boys to do it with someone could deposit a billion dollars in your bank account that day that week and you couldn't e- you wouldn't even spend it until that event was done and it's like man you're living a great life if that's the case dude we we actually went over this it's pretty funny mitch uh mitch ropolato he so kyle and i dug and we usually do almost the entire same line and beer off here and there so we're usually two teams on the majority of the line so mitch ropolato is one of the best bike riders of all time is there digging for kyle every year won't take the money kyle bought him some nice shoes or something one time that's all he would take so he's not there for the money he's there for the experience uh, and then as Luke Whitlock and uh, my my diggers were Henry Wilkins and Damon Iwanaga, who's also another an amazing rider. Um, but Mitch was like, what if you found a million dollars right now picking through this wall, you know? And I was like, wouldn't change anything. He's, <laughs> yeah. he's, like, you, he's like, you wouldn't go home tomorrow? I was like, hell no. And I was like, might as well make it a million one because, yeah. you know, we get uh, the prize is, is 70K and we get, you know, probably got like, probably 100k day after bonuses and stuff so i was like i was like might as well make it a million one dude nowhere i'd rather be never did it for the money we get paid peanuts anyway so might as well (laughs) yeah it literally doesn't change the thing so it's kind of funny you mentioned that and you know we're even talking about you know less money but it's uh it, it we do it do it for the right reasons and try to capitalize on as much money as you can along the way but on that note, all my sponsors are like, dude, running Michelin tires. I don't want to run anything else. Yeah. Oakley goggles. They've, I've been with them for over 20 years. I started getting on flow when I was 15 racing, um, Charlie helmets, of course. And, you know, five ten makes the best shoes. And like it's, uh, Da Vinci bikes and, you know, DD signature, my bars. And then I, I never found the right grips that I wanted. So then I made census. That's why. So like everything that I have is literally what I'd want to be riding anyway. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, uh, yeah, we, we try to take as much money as we can along the way, but also you want to be on the coolest shit and the best shit and the, and the stuff that you are like going to put your life on the line with and feel comfortable with. So, um, yeah, yeah, I've been fortunate enough to make a career out of it as long as I have. And, uh, but yeah, never, never did it for the money. Yeah. No. And I, and I think it's cool. Like if you can, if you can have that context just in everyday life, like if you think, because I mean, I'm definitely guilty of it, you know, like it's just such a, it's pressure. Like you got, and you got a family, you got two kids, like there's all the stuff that no, yeah. like life is heavy all the time, you know, and especially all, when you're the provider and you're like, you're like sure. you, I'm like, you didn't sleep well. Oh, you ever woke up in the middle of the night worrying about taxes or something? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There's like a, there's like a, just a level of built in anxiety over like just having to provide for your family. But yeah, if, I don't know. Like it just, when, when Ian said that, it just fully like it really just changed it i feel like it just changed me that day i was like man there's a lot of times in my life where you could just put that you know deposit all the money fix all the problems and it's like i would not i would not leave this moment i would and it might have not even it might have not even made it better even in the sense of if you had a giant toy hauler and you had it's like it might have actually kind of you know made it worse in some it had it would have slightly less soul and, and it wouldn't contribute to the moment as you had it you know yeah no and that's exactly right like and and you know you you think like why well, you'd go crazy you'd do this and like it just wouldn't make it better yeah like, this is it this is so good now uh-huh. and it's like to just be able to i don't know just like have that much perspective in a moment it was just fucking rad and like even before you got here, I was like watching the videos that we made from it. And it's like, I'll, I'll always have, you know, those weeks and those memories. And it's like, it's not that week. It's every week you race with your dad going up. And it's like, though, every time you go around, but like, we are so lucky to do what we do. Like even just with friends on the weekend, like, and Anthony cartwheel, yes, they fucked himself up. And he was like, I don't regret a damn thing. Yeah, like we we're yeah. driving back from the airport at midnight. I'm smoked, bro. And uh, and he's like, I don't regret any of it, man. I'd do it all again. Like I'd take, I'd get up in the morning and I'd take the crash. And he's like, yeah, I'm not gonna be able to wipe my ass for a little bit, but like, fuck it. Like I'm, I wouldn't change it. It adds cool. It's cool stories, man. I think that there's something about just knowing that this is where you're supposed to be, yeah. you know, and like, and, and realizing that, and reveling in the fact that this is where I'm supposed to be. And then doing it with confidence and conviction is 
probably the greatest feeling that we can have as humans, you know, and that even kind of transcend transcends into friendship. And like, these are, these are the people I'm supposed to be hanging out with. These are my loved ones. These are the people I'm supposed to be loving and be loved by. So to do all of these things and be able to include them in such a cool sport to where they're at the track with you. I mean, that's where you're supposed to be. And to be able to do it like with conviction is like, that's like the greatest part of my life. Like hundred yeah. percent. Well, I think that's one of the reasons like for me personally is to, to say like, I'm a fan of you. It's not the mountain biking. It's not the winning rampage. Like I, I, it's that's shit's dope. And it's like, that's the platform. Like that's your thing that you do. But it's like, when I look at your life and I see your wife and your two kids and they're doing they're like a part of like what you've got going on and then the fact that you've had this 20 year career and it's like you won rampage i think what 10 2010 was like 2010 yeah so it's been 13 freaking years and then yeah but 13 years later like you do it again and it's like there's something that you've figured out in your life and i'm sure there's a lot of things that you've overcome to be that guy like to be the dude that can go 13 years between drinks and like the gnarliest deal that you can do on a mountain bike and it's like but your family's there and it's like i've met your family that's like very happy people you know it's like that you can see that you've really got that figured out and it's like that's what makes me a fan you know that just warms the heart man because that's uh, why you always strive to be just a good person first and foremost and and all these components and kind of ingredients in to make make people and champions up to who they are is really what's enticing and, and intriguing to find out who what's under the helmet of Tomac, you know. Yeah. And even though he doesn't, you know, tell too much and he, and he's not as open to the, to the public, uh, you you still get a feeling that he's get a good a sense. that he's yeah. a good person, and yeah. you want to root for that dude. Like yeah. I like I like that, and I also appreciate that he isn't filming himself constantly, you know. So just to to be like able to to dissect the ingredients to why someone is who they are and what how to how to like myself to to be able to persevere through that and every day is a new set of challenges and having kids and and you know day-to-day life with family and negotiating sponsors and working your way through people thinking you're too old and all this so that is probably the most meaningful thing to me personally as well because I've, you know, long after people told me I should hang it up, even before 2010, I had numerous close friends, photographers and and all these people that were, you know, involved in my life and career. So like, dude, you should, you've had a lot of injuries, man. You should, you're, you got a good eye for photography or you should, you should hang it up. You should, you know, like man to man, knowing the consequences of where that conversation and proposition kind of puts them and, but still felt I, I guess kind of the audacity to, to question my career. And that was before 2010, you know, I'd won Crankworks in 06 was my first real big win. Um, but then after like to, to deal with people like that and then, and then keep going and keep going. Like I, I could have had a cool career and told it, you know, my kids would see that I did, you know, did this for a living when I was younger, but everything that I've done, it just keeps getting better and better and better and better. And I think that's the core mentality of just, overcoming adversity like just to to be confident and and it's like kids been watching the mandalorian lately but like this is the way like this is this is this is where you're supposed to be this is what do it with do it with confidence and keep it going and it just keeps getting better like it long after numerous waves of everyone you're too old or too, you should hang it up or too many injuries to just keep it going is uh, uh it's it makes me feel good about myself. It makes me feel good about and confident about what I'm showing my kids and how I'm raising them. Yeah. And uh, don't, yeah, don't let anyone tell you you can't do it, but also don't let yourself tell you you can't do it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the, there's a big difference between like what you said. So your kids right now, like saying to them, Hey, this is what daddy used to do versus, Hey, come and watch me grind this shit out yeah be a part of this feel the emotion feel the the nerves feel like watch watch what it takes to have whatever greatness is for you like for you rampage is greatness like that's a that's this one that's like a symbol you know where it's like you can you can reach this this is like an end point that if you focus your attention it takes all this work and if the stars line up 
you can achieve this thing. And it's like to the example that you set for your kids when they can physically be there and physically see it. It's like, that's so much different to like a poster of you winning crank works or uh, for you know, sure. it's like, that's a, it's a crazy big difference in their life. And you, you know, you put all like the mountain bike shit aside, just think about your job as a parent to raising a kid man, that's a crazy thing to show Yeah, there's no, kids. no better way to lead by example than that. That's for sure. And that's why I was so adamant about bringing them on the podium and trying, you know, show them like this is your, your life could be so far fetched, like so much past anything that you could ever imagine. Cause like this didn't exist when I was a kid, I wanted mm. to be a racer and I want, so it doesn't even matter what it was, but the same ingredients and, and core like competitive and perseverance and all, all that will lead you to to some medium that can you can have greatness and where wherever it is even if it's not mountain bike it's like i've heard uh i remember drew Brees when he won the super bowl uh had his kid and he you know might have been slightly for the cameras but either way he's he's on down on one knee telling his kids see what happens when you have when you put hard work into something when you when you work hard and don't give up this is what you get like so football or any sport or business anything to to be able to do it with confidence and overcome whatever comes in your way because you know that no matter what it is yeah, there's nothing's in, free everything's going to be competitive in this life no matter what it is like my, my daughter's in dance and she's won a lot of contests in it and and it's the same until i see that grit in her before i could really have an opportunity to tell her or convey it but I, I'm sure she sees it. I'm sure there's something innately in, in her DNA or something, but the, the most of it's probably just seeing, you know, how hard I work and what I've overcome and the injuries and seeing me laid out and mama taking care of me and, and then coming back and uh, to be able to, to get another big one with them on the podium. That was something I wasn't really doubting myself, but you know, like, is this going to happen? Like I need, I really want it more than ever to be able to, be there with them and have them in the finish crawl, not just to see me come down safe, not just to see me. Yeah. You know, like Amanda's more worried about me, about me staying alive and like she's crying and then Ayla's taken after her crying and there is like so much emotions yeah. there. Like a huge build up to one, maybe two runs if it doesn't get winded out. And to, to, to have that on top of all these other layers of emotions and to have then then we add a win onto that and show them how cool this could actually be if you do work hard and that little extra one percent uh, you know what, whatever it might be w whether it was a month leading up to it when you made a better decision or mm -hmm. you, you something didn't pull you off track while you're building or testing and everything starts to kind of happen so fast so to to be able to to show them firsthand like it was greatest day of my life for sure. I mean, I, I said before uh, in 2010, that was the best cause my wife was there and I was able to get the, the F and B world title at that point, but now they don't have it for, um, the group. Uh, now it's just like slope style, but back then it was like the group of mm. slope styles plus some more big mountain events. So I didn't have an extra accolade of world champ on it, but it did it. Rampage is it like that's so to, to show them, and have them be there with me greatest day of my life for sure oh man and i was that was gonna be my next question is like what's the what's the polarity between winning it without kids versus winning it with kids like i bet it just adds a whole new layer and dimension to it yeah man, that there's more on the line you're you're there to provide for him you, you know if god forbid like paul paul was paralyzed out there and um, Kyle broke his back last year you know when i was there riding the same line and they they know how heavy it is and but it at the same time, I, I tell them very candidly, this is how I want you guys to live your life. I want you guys to overcome risk. And I don't necessarily even want you to pursue mountain biking as a career, yeah, yeah. but I want you to, to, to see whatever obstacle it is and, and go for it. You because, know? because you don't choose. It's funny. Like it's just kind of fresh because of yesterday, like, cause it's my wife's first experience kind of like going through anything like that. And you know, she, you could see the waves that she went through where she was like, I don't want you doing this anymore. Like, this isn't cool. Like, what if it was me and like, we got kids and like, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, fuck, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I get it. But there's... And that's another form of adversity too. Like that, them, like your wife telling you, you're like, well, 
if you if you were kind of fickle or on the fence that just your wife telling you shouldn't is what why a lot of people hang up the moto boots or the or the five tens and you know don't ride anymore i can't take the risk i can't you know because the wife doesn't want me to so i'm, I'm in a privilege of being a little bit better position to you know, that's why she doesn't have to work that's why you know yeah. that's how we provide for our family and um so i guess that but at the same time I, but you would I, do it anyway. I, w- I would. Because and, you, and, you don't choose what you love. Like you yeah. don't, you know, you, you've had a unique set of circumstances in your life that led up to this point of mountain bikes is, you know, it's like the cliche thing where it's like motos in your DNA or like mountain bikes is in my DNA. It's like you just, there's a part of you that was, I don't know, just like built around this, you know, and there's like, there's a certain part of this that, feeds your soul it feeds my soul like i've never been paid to do a damn race in my life like well that's cost me thousands and thousands of dollars but it's like there's something there like there's something very important and if it's like for me to live a the life that i would need to live like that there's certain things that just have to be a part of it and it comes with risk yeah you you've, you've been paid and compensated in different ways though you know the perspective and and those experiences and trail ride that you couldn't like couldn't yeah, you even can't get that like what's your life without that yeah i've i always try to like my wife spends a lot of time at the gym and i feel like she works out more than i <laughs> than i work out and like i'm a professional, <laughs> a professional athlete. athlete but uh i've she's i don't know sometimes mo- moto is an easier target because i don't have to be riding moto but it's 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 uh, better for this conversation because it's I'm like darling this is my church my gym yep. my therapist yep. my uh um randy richardson my michelin team manager called it a broptism because i always call it brop therapy and he's like yeah it's a broptism bro <laughs> yeah 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 but dude you get so much and granted it takes time to load up time to ride drive to the track ride wind down hang on the tailgate for a minute with the boys and then drive home clean the bike you know it it takes hours upon hours but it's it's so many things concentrated in it for my well-being and my mental state and i mean i i don't think i would really be a happy person without them i would try and i would like to think that i could overcome that but dude it's uh mountain biking and moto and even and surfing now and, and snowboarding mm. and they are they are what I need to be myself. You yep. know, it's not like ingrained in your DNA, DNA, but then also ingrained just in your day to day life. They're ingrained in what you do, what you're stoked for when you wake up, how you eat, how you coordinate your day, and and there's it's it's a concentrated you know kind of I don't of so many things that you can't really even explain as well. Yeah, yeah, no, I completely agree, and and I think like I had one experience when I. I was just at home. I bought a 96 CR 250. Sick. <laughs> and I was just like, that's like my fucking Rolex of bikes. Like I'll just never, I'll never sell it. I just don't care how much money it costs. Like that means something to me, that bike, you know? Yeah. And so I bought this thing and it was like basically stock, like how it came. It's like, I'm fucking riding this thing like properly. And so I started going to these vintage motocross days in Australia and I was like this shit comes with stress like business owner comes with stress like me and my we had like this big long distance separation through covid so life's fucking hectic for everybody no matter who you are no matter what you're doing right and so i'm at the track and i'm riding this vintage bike and like my brakes have felt like all day it was just like it it was just a thing everything was a thing and Mm -hmm. i was like on the i was on the track and then i come off and then like my rear brakes stopped working so then i had to like hustle a rear brake and then went out for the next ride something else happened and then a guy comes over and he's talking to me for 20 minutes and another guy so my day it just like went Uh, all that i was just going and going and going and going and then i got in the car and I like I smoked a joint and got in the car and started driving home. And I just like, it was like finally my, my first minute to myself in a sense. And just the, you notice like, I just noticed the, like the thoughts rushing back to me of like, I got to pay this bill. Like, did my staff get paid? Like everything come rushing back. And it was, it, it was just so obvious what this day had done for me you know like what you kind of got away from like the the, and then it made me just be like whoa 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 what boys 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 chill like you gotta stop like i'm not ready right now to be derailed in this sense by my mind and all of these different thoughts and response like yes they're all there 
yes, I need to deal with those. But like, that's the, na- that's our natural, st- like if I didn't have moto, like that's what my brain would have been doing to me before I got to the track. And probably paralyzing you from even being able to do Make all those decisions. Things. Yeah. See that I, I love the whole feeling of how, how okay you are with foregoing all the other day-to-day tasks and duties and, and a long to-do list when you do decide to go ride or you like just get out and do it you just completely fine with neglecting all the other stuff right <laughs> yeah, and then yeah, yeah. and granted there you know especially coming back from a big trip and all the things that you did push put off the table for a little bit so you could focus on on an event or a race but you know those those do kind of pile back up and then coming back home and having to be dad and and wanting to be dad but then also it's an adjustment period but i love how just righteous it is when you do leave (laughs) you're like i don't care about all this i get to focus on this like right now that's this is what i want i wish i could do this every day all day every day but you know like at least i get to do it right now dude that's so sick so when did you first start racing mammoth and like did your so i've never seen you ride i'm assuming you fucking rip but when did you like so you're 20 you start riding when did you do that first race how did you take to riding was it like a hard adjustment and then like how did you take to like the the racing side of things dude i got uh i I don't know why i because i've never liked yamaha since i never had a tie to him but for in um i guess it was it was 06 so i got an 06 uh yz 250 pretty good block though pretty good yeah they're just even for a novice level like i i needed you know i should have got the suspension done right away didn't know about that didn't know how to even just get it resprung and and dude when you're not that good at riding moto and you come up short or go long on a on a jump now you wouldn't even think about it you don't even care but it, at that time we're like dude that freaking hurt my <laughs> ankles and my knees because yeah. you're just blowing through it uh, but it's it's a good bike it was still uh, like I, I i didn't have anyone to teach me i had a uh, a friend that lived with me more of my brother's friend and he rode moto most of his life but like really you know amateur lower just like level. a club dude yeah he, d- he did a couple races when he was younger so i didn't have anyone to teach me good body mechanics and when you're tired on a moto you you start <laughs> developing bad habits yeah. even though i know on a bike you know yeah. and it's almost the same thing i think the biggest differences are just leaning back on jumps versus leaning forward on jumps because you have the throttle and like but you know it's squeezing with your knees because you can't really do that on a bike or uh, or squeezing with your ankles, which actually you kind of sometimes do do on a mountain bike, but it's, it, it didn't translate as, as much as I would have hoped. But then as I did, um, Hangtown one year, they had this, God, what did they call it? it you, the year before I did, it was actually the halftime show for the Hangtown national in between moto one and moto two. And like Palmer and, and all, and, um, Victor Sheldon and all these other yeah, dudes yeah. and all these uh they were there was the action sports class um they had a they had a cool name for it but aaron cook was was organizing it and i sucked dude like <laughs> i couldn't put together a full i think i think we did a fair amount of laps so probably 15 20 minute moto on and hangtown gets really rutted which is the hardest thing that i'm not used to well that's the big thing on mountain bikes is like you don't really get ruts in the same no, way no and you don't want to ride the cushion on a corner that's where you're Slow. gonna you're gonna yeah. just, well and you're gonna just wash the front of you don't have the throttle to push through the tire zone is wide enough so it's totally counterintuitive for me and i yeah i suck but i i loved it like i was so freaking tired and beat and whooped and i didn't do that well you know beat a few guys obviously but i uh I, it, it took longer than I thought it would, but I loved it so damn much. And I idolized all these dudes and, and I wanted, I wanted to race moto. I want, so then you just, I don't know, you get better and knew I actually started getting better at freestyle before racing. Cause Adam Jones, um, oh, Dustin yeah. Miller, Mike yeah. Mason, all those dudes. And so I, are you from up North California? I'm from Carson city, Nevada. Okay. So, so that's yeah. where, uh, Dustin Miller and Mike Mason and them yeah, are from yeah, yeah. and Adam Jones moved there to live with them. So we'd go like, Paul Bass and I would actually like pedal off of one of the 75 foot kicker ramps, like start up there on bikes and pedal into the foam pit because we didn't have any foam pits there. But then somewhere along the line, I bought a, um, actually I jumped a 75 foot ramp on that shit box with stock suspension. <laughs> and Adam was like, I've never seen anyone hit it on a stock 250 F. I think just follow me and like, and grease it. And he's like, dude, you should probably have a freestyle bike. 
So then I bought one of his uh, 07, uh, is actually his X Games winning bike. No shit. Uh, CR250? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, it they didn't like doing too much to the motors because when they travel, they don't want to have to do all do that to it. Yeah. yeah. But uh, it had freestyle suspension, and I remember landing dead flat on a 75 for ramp and casing it and being totally fine and doing some seat grabs and stuff. But uh, I don't know, shortly after that, I start I got a Honda 450 and just kind of life changing and and I uh, was you know, trying to race as many motor races as I could fit into the schedule and because at that time I was doing way more slope style contests, going to Europe a bunch and on a lot of traveling. And then we have cold winters so you can ride in the winter, but it's not quite as good. We don't have tons of moto tracks, but uh, any chance I'd get, you know, trying to trying to go race moto and uh, met uh, Brian Culper, who was there with Palmer at the race I broke my leg at and we're super good friends at and we have super good friends now and we're like building like like doing renos and flips and stuff in Tahoe. So developed a cool relationship for something else, like a side hustle with him through that. Oh, sick. Yeah. Like the, the moto community has been like, I don't know. It's, it's a special place. Like so many good friends that you wouldn't have never came yeah, across. Yeah. Uh, like Matt Veer camp and Matt Barber and, and Ryan McElfish and all these dudes just love them to death. And they're uh, the common interest. The only times I really get to see him is, is riding and racing moto yeah dude that's so cool yeah so are you brand loyal to anybody now do you have like you're a honda guy yeah i think i've it feels kind of sacrilegious dude i like i get uh or i have for the last three or four years uh a loaner uh works edition 450 is like a loaner bike and then kind of the opportunity to buy it for cheaper and then trade or trade it in so they're asking me to bring down uh the current one but i i should be able to get another one and then uh love that bike honda you know the ergonomics of a Honda, uh, you know, you can't like, I don't care if the suspension or there's more power and all these other ones are, but the, the Honda is like, I, I love, love the feel of it. And obviously Michelin Tyler tires, they, you know, flow me that. So that's, that takes some costs away and I have plenty of Oakley goggles and TLD gear. And, and you know, so it's, it's, it's nice to be somewhat supported through mountain biking Yeah, yeah. and goggles, not to mention like the best gift ever. Cause they're like 200 bucks, but I have an abundance of them. So like, Hey, you know, trade you for some chain loop or something. You know? Yeah. Dude. So I got, um, shout out to the boys at Oakley. I'm a big Oakley guy as well. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, they bought me at Loretta's, a, like a goggle, an Oakley goggle bag. Sick. And I, and it had three pairs of goggles in it. And then another goggle bag, which is all lenses like every different kind of lens and i that was one of the i texted them all after and i was like boys you have no idea what you just did for me like that is the dopest of the dope like i was the kid i never had a goggle bag i always wanted a goggle bag i never had a goggle bag and i never had tear-offs like so tear-offs I, are huge oh uh, i was the kid that would come in after a moto and I would like clean my tear offs because I had one pack of tear offs for however long. And then you, know. you and then you get laminated tear offs, and you're like, "What the oh. fuck?" I think so you didn't even realize you could melt cheese or something before that. <laughs> oh. Wait, I could melt this cheese? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can toast bread. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but oh man, that was one of the most like meaningful things I've ever been given was awesome. just like some dope Oakleys with all the lenses I ever need, and I think it was like. So I got, this is how like stingy I am with my shit, right? I got given four packs of tear offs. Maybe it was five packs of laminates in July. And I put like 24 or 25 hours on my 350 preparing for world vets. So I was riding it like all the tracks, public tracks. And I did well vets and I still have like three packs of tear offs. Like that's, that's awesome. I'm just like, I'm traumatized from a kid with tear offs. But like that shit is like the most meaningful thing I could get on a bike. Dude, and you're never, yeah, th- you just know that the moment when you needed them on a muddy day, you're me like, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, dude, 100%. <laughs> and it's not some, I don't know, it's not some, you weren't getting free X goggles. You're like, oh, tight. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, I'm getting the dopest goggles ever made. Like, bar none yeah yeah so it's like uh th- th- those little things like they i guess you just your inner child kind of like never dies in yeah. a way too you know? yeah yeah dude getting like uh getting boxes from oakley is still just as exciting as when i was a kid you know yeah. that was the first free products i ever got and i could not believe it like for some for a couple pair of free shades and a couple goggles and maybe some shirts and stuff could not like my life was complete at that point you know and it's still sometimes the swag and like 
like st- shout out to stance socks they don't pay me but like when a box of fresh stance shock stock shows up i'm like one of my favorite things is show up at the door and i they built such a cool brand right it's it's the cultivators of cool and and it again they don't pay me but i just absolutely love it because they're such a rad brand and they make such rad stuff just like just like oakley you know and troy lee and all these that that's definitely almost cooler than the paycheck paycheck showing up because you know that you need to live but <laughs> but it doesn't have yeah. the it doesn't have the allure of opening up and just huh. oh and the, yeah i guess it's just i don't know for me like even uh so jose from alpine stars so i same uh-huh. thing with like alpine stars you know so jose there he sent me um he sent me some boots like i got like the full i got the um you know when that Chicago Bull stuff came out that Sexton was running? Yeah. And so I got the white and the red and it had my name and it was like in the Alpine That's Stars huge. font. Like it was so sick. And, and I got that and then I got the boots to match. And I like, I just sent him a message and I was like, dude, I could have literally jerked off over tech eights when I was a kid. <laughs> like it was so unobtainable for me. Like I just, we just were not that family that had the best shit, you know? And it, it it's like almost if i look back like if i could go back to my teenage self and just be like bro just chill everything is gonna work out fine like you'll end up getting your boots well, it, made you'll you, end up... it made you appreciate it more right oh and i mean it probably adds to like the drive and the hunger to do what i did in in life and this because it was like i knew i wasn't gonna be a racer because i just wasn't that very good and i knew that i couldn't afford any of the shit on my own so it was just like there was I loved it so much that like I had to forge a path, you know, but they're like definitely came with some trauma <laughs> as a kid. And like, I should have just focused on the fact that my dad took me riding and yes, I had a shit bike. And yes, if you tried to change my tires, you probably would have to cut them off with an angle grinder. But it's like, bro, you're in the 1% that like has a dad that is willing to take him. Right. So I was like distracted by the wrong shit, but it made it that much sweeter in life when I was like that box showed up and it was even like the order form was in Italian. Yeah. And like, you know, I sent him a message. I'm like, man, you just have no idea how much it means to be in like a position in life where that kind of box shows up and it's got my name. Right. I'm like, that's fucking special dude. Like that means as much to me as anything I could ever have in life you know and it's like a retail value of twelve hundred dollars or whatever it is it's not that much money but it's like god it means a lot yeah it's the it's the thought that counts and it also speaks to those brands of how well they've done it as far as remaining exclusive yet somewhat attainable but then to just have the allure i mean that's that's my goal with my brand like i want like i don't know how you do that with grips very well but like the grips and pedals and seats you know and tailgate pads i want people to do that dope thanks man yeah yeah put yeah. a lot of work into it and sacrifice a lot of margin because i mean it takes so long to develop them just you know pretty much myself as far as developing and had have uh, like my brother helping and former employees but it's uh dude it's it's hard like and then to to see how much that their their our cost of goods are higher than a lot of people are selling their shit yeah but at the same time i want it to be the coolest shit the most the most sought after products that you could possibly get and hopefully one day some kid will be saying that or maybe they already do hopefully that'd be pretty rad some of the groms or or kids coming up like dude dang these pedals are unreal like i I had dreamed about these and you know, that's, oh, that's my goal. Happen. That's my goal is, is owning a brand. So yeah, hats off to, to the Oakleys and the A star boots and TLDs that, that do it right and create a product that is just more valuable than the money on the yeah, price tag, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like greater than the sum of its parts. And it's like, yeah. it contributes to, I guess just thinking about it now, it's like it contributes to like a life that you live. Yeah. You know, it's like that. There's, there's yeah, definitely... brands are kind of like living, breathing things. Right. And especially yeah. if the products can hold up to that reputation. Yeah. It's something special for sure. Yeah. And you're like, it's associated with your lifestyle. Like you can kind of, you know, if you, you see a guy like Troy Lee, for example, that's like a really great example. Like if you see a guy that's like wearing Troy Lee designs gear, that's like a very intentional purchase Mm -hmm. like that there's a guy that he's like trying to say something about himself his style who he is by running troy lee and and i feel like that's why i like that's why i like alps and oakley you know like i can put that stuff on i'm like this is like 
who I identify with as a racer. Like, you know, I don't, I want to have like the best shit, super clean. Like that's, I feel like my, I guess I'm showing my personality. Straight in a up, sense, you know, straight up, man. Uh, Ryan Kondrashoft, who's actually now a TLD rep, but this was, he used to be a pro racer and his, and his now wife Sid was, he was, he was just like in awe of my fresh home at Sea Otter. I think it was just got a fresh painted home. And he's just like, dude, this is so sick, you know? And she's just like, yeah. I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. and, he, and he's like, this is like <laughs> you getting a custom Louis purse. For and sure. She's all, you know, that's it, exactly what it is. is. The closest thing. And I mean, I don't, the, an older wise man or something with a new watch or something, you know, yeah, like yeah. this is like the dopest thing that I could get right now. Yeah. And yeah. I sure I could pay for the, the paint factory to probably make one or something, you know, but the fact that they gave this to me for like, is just worth you know worth way more than the paychecks oh man a hundred percent and I, i'm sure it feels the same with like the the bike you know you're getting something from honda because like you talk about legacy brands like dude hrc like just that's yeah. it that's the top you know yeah and i think that i, I kind of skipped the point of where i was going with uh with how it feels kind of sac- sacrilegious because there's dudes that are lining up for supercross main events that are buying their bikes and i'm like why the hell do i get this but i'm like i'm sure as hell gonna take it i'm sure as hell <laughs> yeah. gonna, and grand they're not giving it it's a, it's a loner but still i'm you know it's a, it's an honor to have them think you know this mountain biker you know provide some roi for him being on a hunt I'm like that's bitching well i think it's cool like even i was thinking about it before when you were just talking about how much you love moto like i don't know it's even just cool for me to feel like this conversation like your voice is now attached to moto yeah you know like and to me it's one of the things i love the most about doing the podcast is that it's like man this guy loves this shit like it's cool to have it i guess our sport acknowledged by someone that's at the top of their own sport and it's like these are the values this is why i like it this is what it does for me because you know, it's such like, yeah, you, we said before, it's like a weird selfish thing to like pack up your dirt bike, spend all day. Like for me in Australia, I have to drive an hour minimum to ride. So it's like, I'm up at five 30, I'm packing my shit. I'm in the car, I'm riding, I'm coming home. I'm what, like my days, time, yeah, dude. my days gone. My wife's like, bro, what are you doing? Or like, how does it take this long to ride? I'm and just I'm, stoked on being pumped right now. Yeah. And I'm just like, Hey, this could go on for like, hours more and, yeah. I, and i'm cruising but it's like so i guess it's cool that you know i don't you it validates in a sense that like there's something special here and it, it was it's reciprocal too because with you know the the time that i came up in our sport is a, is a new genre and again transferring from racing to free riding and when it didn't really exist uh, we watched nothing's for free last night at the laguna film fest which is a really good representation of the and just a candid look at back of how the sport came to be with Brett Tippy and Richie Schley and, and all the neural disorder movies and stuff. But at that time I was just an ignorant little shit of a racer. Like we're better than these guys, you know? Yeah. And, and so I, but when we, it did come time for me to give up world cups and, and focus more on slope style and, and big mountain and rampage. It was a, a really cool turning point because I felt like I had the responsibility and the opportunity to help shape it a little bit, you know, and I had all these other sports that I idolized that Mm. I look to. So when we get validated by Travis Rice or, you know, or, you know, Ricky Carmichael or, or McGrath, like MC is a big mountain biker and, and have having the sports that I look to for inspiration to take my medium of riding a mountain bike and where's next, like, again, like in hindsight, it was a little dick, a little ignorant, little shit, but like, oh, these guys are kooks. I'm better. We're better. Kyle Strait and I, we're better than these guys on bikes. We're going to take our racing pedigree and, and skill set, and we're going to take it into free riding. Where are we going to look? We're going to look at snowboarding and moto and freestyle moto and skateboarding. And um, so when, when we're acknowledged by all these other sports, it is the greatest of honors, you know, to, to have someone else respect what we do because it didn't exist when I was a mm. kid. And then we helped to try to make it so like I, f- I take ownership of it and have take so much pride in where the sport is now that we've worked so hard for it, put the sport first instead of, you know, trying to just take money and go to this cash guy series and try to let it, let the 
promoters take it where they want where you know we want we we left our mark and tried to for, you know push it in the directions that we wanted to from our values and the things that we appreciated in the rest of the world and why are these other sports so freaking cool i don't know yeah. but we're going to try to take those you know ingredients and put them into this new this new sport well there was a time too like when you said carl straight like i remember like i was racing downhill like i just was so obsessed with it like loved it so much and like yeah carl straight just a gangster bro like as a, as a junior with the red bull helmet just the socal kid just so cool so much talent and then you'd see him racing world cups and doing that whole deal and then it there'd be like the same edit yeah where, where he'd be race full racer and then doing the dirt jump stuff and then the big mountain stuff and rampage and you were just like that was such a crazy time where guys were just so transient doing both and then it's just like peeled off made this new thing and man for what like you think about like bender in, in crusties like shout out to bender like, straight up <laughs> savage shit that he was doing but that was like early freestyle where you know the image was just shit like it was so if it went in that direction forever then you you don't have a lot of what you have now but it's like yeah it really took a group of guys to come together with the vision for what like i'm sure you saw what he was doing and what those early guys were doing it's like no this could actually be way more meaningful dude he ever i think every sport needs a bender to some degree like the guy that's gonna jump off something that no one thought was possible no, and then he jumped off shit that wasn't possible <laughs> but then you then you look at it and you're like well i mean no nothing against bender but like you're like all right if he almost landed that with yeah. his skill level yeah. i think that we could do it if we built a better landing you know we learn how to use water more out there and pack things in and like but there i don't know there's been cliffs we've done since then that are you know fully natural like uh you know stole it from snowboarding but ft just first tracks fresh tracks like yeah to just feel like they're like dude if we set up our bikes better and we learn how to hit this like that actually probably is pro possible so i think everyone every sport needs a bender but uh back to kyle because that is he was the greatest bike rider on the planet at that point dude yeah he was, for real huh he was uh i think he he would he would top 10 and four cross and this is before True, there was huh? there was there was a junior class in world cup so like he's his first world cup i think was when he was 16 or 17 and and this is in the elite class and he qualified like 17th and then it got rained out that was the year that uh, gary houseman won because of the the, mm. the rain uh, but then dude kyle's got an 11th i think 11th and a 12th at like fort william and that was when he was under 18 that was when before that was before there was even a junior class and at the same time he won he's winning rampage at in uh in 04 like that same year it's like the greatest bike rider in the world just doing the damn thing with so much style and and talent and, and fun and looking good yeah. like dude to have like the whole oakley kit and the red bull helmet and the cover of bike and all these like it it was it was a perfect time for the sport and like this all right this is this is the way we're going and this is kind of the the what if there was one human that would want to put on the face of mountain biking i think it was kyle in 04 it's just, it's yeah it's sick to be be a part of that and be you know be his best homie and we're we're in it together and he had a bigger name than i did uh, by quite a bit then but i was you know we're just helping each other racing you know and and dirt jumping and you know even film some street in our parts just whatever we could do to try to push it in a direction and gain all the skill sets that we wanted to to make it not bender but not racing and not you know blending yeah. blending everything we can from like tj lavin and nastasio from from bmx and you know some some big mountain snowboarding and then the moto feel and vibe and it was it, it, a really cool time and i and i treasure the that i was just born at that time and was able yeah. to be in the infancy of the sport yeah yeah because there's so much luck involved in just like the timing timing's everything that, right that you come up you know do you remember the first time you saw those bender clips in crusties yeah i could i could not believe it. Well, he was in a there uh thor wixom made the two movies called down and double down back then and, oh, that was, and yeah. i and i and i think that they were the first ones to do it and then crusty's like what the fuck is this <laughs> we're gonna take this guy and put him in our movies and it was i don't know a little sideshow bob for as a racer because you know 
Kavarik was really outspoken about hucking, fuck hucking. We can't, this is not the way we're not doing this. <laughs> but then, I don't know, I guess it, it, that's, that was us being malleable enough to where we're like, I think you could do that, and I think you could do it with style. And then Dave Watson and Andrew Shandro were the first to really do bigger cliffs in Ride to the Hills, a, yep. an old, old movie, you know? Yeah, yeah, and I yeah, was I like, that. I was like, all right, this is what's up. It's they, on. They hit, they hit that proper step down out in Utah and did it with, you know, probably, you know, just full race suspension. That isn't tuned for a bigger drop. So, and you don't need much small bump out there, so you, you can afford to set it up a lot stiffer. And they're still making it look good. So, you know, every, you know, the bikes advance, we get better at building, the riding advances, and, and now the kids can grow up looking at that. They're just going to be ridiculous. Like, they already are. Like, Talis Turk and Hayden and some of the some of the kids coming up are going to be ridiculous soon. Oh, yeah. Well, do you think about um, – he Bender was almost like the first big wave surfer. Yeah. In a sense. Like, there's a lot of parallels with what you guys yeah. do to big wave That's surfing. That's a good – yeah, good. Especially, like, on Maui right now, too. Like, you're getting to know, like, Albie and those guys and, like, having Jaws there. It's, like, it's a very similar mindset and it's a very similar type of guy where it's, like, you know, I mean, Albie, Matt Miola, like, Kai, Lenny, like, those guys. I mean, they could have been on the world tour. Yeah. It's the same kind of deal of like ditching the CT and being like, there's something out here for us to ride these huge waves, uncharted territory. We're developing equipment and, you know, like safety and everything in real time. It's like, there's a lot of parallels there, you know? Yeah. And it takes out like with, with the experience and the perspective and just the the longevity of of taking one bender and then or some the first person to try to surf jaws or then the first person to try to like paddle into jaws and yeah and then now you're seeing people that are doing it safer with taking out a lot of the layers of risk yeah but then also being able to go bigger and more consistent and the talent pool gets deeper but it also goes back to the the kind of initial topic run is is the just the mindset it doesn't really even matter the medium it's like the same ingredients that you can appreciate in all these other athletes all these other sports and pushing the limits and then it gets to the point to where you're you're splitting hairs but everyone's a little safer and you're still able to push it just as far and now it's a legitimate sport to where it's not just some random dude jumping off you know (laughs) throwing the sheets to the wind and and hoping that they (laughs) land it's like you know there's a really good there's a really good chance that you're gonna that you're gonna land it and and everyone else starts coming in like all right i want to do this too but it definitely takes you know i'd like to know who the bender of of jaws and and i guess it's a lot of mavericks but i think those uh i've heard stories about a lot of the mavericks dudes being uh on pcp and stuff so maybe that maybe their bender was <laughs> Dude, drugs. bender was probably on pcp too have, have you ever met him <laughs> oh yeah no i know bender i've known bender, known bender for a long time he's a he's a What's judge his story he's like? a judge at rampage man no, oh really? So he's yeah. like, yeah, sorry, I'm like not that in. The no, scene, it's all so, good. Yeah. He he has to. Are you you have to be a previous competitor? That's like yeah. one of the only qualifications. So and then they take the top score and the bottom score out and average the middles. But uh, apparently, I've I've never seen their scores. They don't show them. But apparently, Bender's is always the highest, like yeah. 95, just the most yeah. stoked dude. His, his scores just never getting used. <laughs> yeah, he he's a little out there, uh, but he that's why he is who he is i remember hearing matt hoffman and pastrana saying he's the the most impressive action sports athlete or like one of the greatest you know expanders of these sports you know i i can't remember how they worded it but they both commented on him being extremely prolific for all sports not just mountain biking so it i he shout out to bender dude you you need the guy that is willing to go with with this much possibility of landing it and this much yeah. chance of crashing and this much risk. Yeah. Cause like the risk equation is like what the consequences times likelihood, you know? And, yeah. and, and his was just so below everyone else's threshold. Like when I go up, I'm like, I know there's a huge chance I could crash and there's probably a chance I could even die doing it. If I do, if it does go wrong, but the reward is so great and the likelihood of me landing it is so much higher than it ever was in the past and i just feel dialed and that's that's a really cool place to be in your head that put my wife at ease of you know the, i'm I don't want you to worry, and I'm not just saying this to put you at ease. I just want you to realize how confident I am that this is 
no longer a question of is this possible because there's been a lot of times in my career with like in 2010 no one ever spun a drop even close to as big as that yeah, dude. and other other times in my life where i'm like i'm putting a lot out here that i don't know if it's quite possible but if i do crash i think i'm gonna be all right you know get banged up but I'll, i think it's worth breaking my leg for this or something you know like i but uh nowadays i'm like there's a chance I could crash. There's a chance that the un- the ino- like the worst the worst case, the worst case yeah. scenario could happen. But I just want you to know, full truth and honesty, that I feel so good about it that I know it's possible. It's just a matter of performing on game day. It's like it's a matter of more of the competition side of it. And like first round, I completely blew it, and that's that switched me over to even more of just a straight game day mindset, which. I treasure that we don't, I don't get to compete as much anymore and there aren't many contests I would want to do. So rampage is the pinnacle, the biggest one. So to be able to devote all my competitive spirit and anything that I've been lacking and there's been a void of needing that it's, I get to put it out and focus all on the biggest one. And it's uh yeah, it, 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 it grows you a little bit with, um, feeling like you're a part of almost a club of all sports, right? Yeah. Even watching Verstappen when you're like, dude, I, can totally understand. I get it. I like. Yeah. It doesn't matter the medium. It doesn't matter the sport or football or Drew Brees or or Moto. Like, I just love that that like feeling of commonality that you could like. I dude, I feel like if I was bred to be a football player, you know, I'd figure out a position with my size or something. You know, like. Yeah. I think you. I I just love that. The, yeah. I love that it it's the same sign of sort of mindset and that can get you anywhere you want in life and business. And I just feel really, really fortunate to have this medium and have the opportunity to be at the, the top of my sport and be able to live out all, all my wildest dreams and and um, make me feel good about what I do every day when I go to bed. Yeah, and, and you're right. Like I think it was something that I, and I talk about it a bunch on here, but I was of the, I was one of the kids that grew up being like, I just don't have the talent. Yeah. I don't have the talent. I don't, and I just... I never experienced a win in the sense of like work hard to get something and get it. You, you know? ever read the book Grit and Angela Duckworth? I'm not sure. Dude, it's, it's, it's I don't fascinating, think I man. It's, it shows there's a, and Andrew Huberman did a podcast on the same kind of idea recently that if, you know, and all these, this data that's coming out now of, of if you tell a kid they're good at something, and, yeah, and they're, yeah, they're yeah, gifted yeah, yeah. and then they then they start performing worse on the, yep. the next test yep. you know yep. it's the yep. same yep. and all the kids are like you worked really hard for this and then they're like oh the exact same test for everyone else their score is trended higher yeah so i think the idea of of talent we're all guilty of it right like he's just got something that yeah like axel hodges has like dude but he's put in a lot of work for learning how to wheelie and and do his and land wheel like all, all the all the things that you don't see behind the scenes, you just you. It's an easy target to say like, oh, they just got it. They got yeah. something that I don't. And it's a form of like mental weakness. It kind of is, huh? But uh, but and, and I don't think it was really prevalent and or even exposed in to to our generation or For you know, sure. like when you're younger, like oh, that's just that's just the way it is, you yeah. know. So it's I like the opposing opinion nowadays, and now it's it's gaining some steam that dude, you put in the work. I'm fully on board now, yeah, like 100. percent And and the problem is, and I'll I'm fully fine with admitting it. Like I just never worked hard enough at something, you know. And like I just I never there's a barrier that you need to go through. And mm-hmm. I think there's a there's a thing too where you need the rewards and you don't get the rewards right away. Well, and I, I think too, like sometimes what you want to be good at isn't what you're good at. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's like if you, you can kind of get stuck, like all I wanted to be good at was was moto. And it's like you, it just wasn't set up like that. You know, like the, and the kids that were good, they like the kid that was winning every race in my hometown, like we're a super small hometown. Like he just had a farm and he had a track in his yard and he rode every single day after school. Like, of course he looked more talented than me that rode once every two weeks and you know but then it wasn't until like embarrassingly enough it's like later in life when i started doing jiu-jitsu i just got so fucking obsessed with it for the first two years that i was doing it and i worked literally harder than everybody that was in our gym and i got so fucking good so quick in such a short period of time and then i it was just like ah you're an idiot like you've spent your whole life thinking that 
that you didn't have this or you didn't have that. But really what you didn't have is like, you didn't work hard enough in the right way at the right thing. And it's like, when you line up though, there's like a, a couple little ingredients and then you line that up. And when I had my first, but even like the, you know, the first, I first comp I did, I got fucking embarrassed. Like I almost didn't do the next matches cause it was so bad, you know, but it's like, you just, I worked through and I worked through and that was like a click for me. But then I look back and I'm like, Oh, look at the podcast. Like, look at the stuff. Like, what, what was the timeline for your jujitsu upbringing or, you know, the, your first jujitsu training and competition oh, compared, dude, I, compared to the podcast? Um, in terms of like, when did I start the podcast? When did I start? Yeah. The, guess what year I was just saying that that helped. That was uh, it, the opportunity to disguise that that came after moto, but then you still had the moto lifestyle, but then that gave you what you needed to start this. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's pretty much how it sort of lined up. Like it, it is pretty crazy. So I, I basically got kicked out of the U S so I lived here for like eight years and then got cut and i was like fuck i'm i need to go home i'm like 29 i've lost a bunch of money i like it really messed my situation up and the podcast started out of like necessity in a sense like i had a couple cameras i had literally these might like everything's the same and i didn't really have a choice and i just grinded it out and i i would sit i'd sit at my desk i had nothing to do bro like nothing i lived with my parents and i was just like a full in everyone's eyes like a massive failure so i was just like fuck it like i can spend a year doing this and just like only this i didn't take any i got offered some jobs and some like action sports companies at home and i just didn't take any of it and then it was like random i went and watched a buddy's his son one of my best friends his son did a jiu-jitsu match and I was like kind of commentating with him or like I could speak. And he's like, dude, what, how do you know about jujitsu? I'm like, man, I've watched UFC for like, since I was a kid, since I was like 14, I've watched the early, early days on tape. So anyway, then he's like, just go do a class. And I'm like, you know what? I have like nothing going on right now. Like I actually could do this. Went and did a class, got fucking bashed, but I kind of knew what was going on. I went on Amazon, I ordered the jujitsu encyclopedia and I literally read this book in like one weekend. But anyway, I got like fully obsessed with it and I think it was a bit of an outlet because I felt like a massive failure in like the rest of my life. I definitely look like a failure to my friends. I definitely, I know I look like a massive failure to my parents. So it was just kind of like a place I could go and I just, I, it was like a massive escape for me, you know? But man, it just taught like it just revealed the secrets of life in a sense where it was like if you go here twice a day and i was broken bro like i was so sore i was coming home and i'm like damn near 30 years old like good so though, huh? it, it did it started to feel good and it was i you could see the progression and and people would then it, it was the first time in my life sorry to hijack the conversation no it's all good it was the first time in my life people were ever like man you're so talented and I'll just be and like, like I, but I'm like, you're wrong. Like, I'm not like, you should see, I go home and I'm like reading and studying and I'm, I'm like, I'm just working harder than everybody. And the, I think the crazy thing with jujitsu is that there's people that start the same day as you every day. So like someone's doing their first jujitsu class right now. And in that same gym, there'll be a dude that'll walk in. And it's either his first day or he's been there three weeks or one. Like, so you have a really good gauge of like who's starting today. You wear a belt yeah, you know, and you don't, if you've got one stripe on your belt, you've probably been there three months. If you've got two on your belt, you've been there. So it's very, very clear, like who is starting the level, like where you should be at. So you can really see like a progression, but man, that basically just translated into the it was just like a light bulb light bulb moment you know and it's like it made me look at everybody differently like everybody that i ever was like fuck they're just so talented they're just natural i'm like nah man like he's done something like he, there's something that he has been prepared to do in his life that other people weren't prepared to do yeah the the stripes is probably a really good for lending jujitsu to be the catalyst for you because I don't know. There's not, I guess you'd see how good someone's bike is or how, yeah. you know, but the, you instantly have the transparency of, all right, this is where they're supposed to be. Not like, I feel like I'm unwelcome. I, these guys are going to think that I've been doing this my life or, you know, it gives you a clear like kind of timeline of, all right, 
you know, this guy needs to learn. And it also kind of takes it off your shoulders that everyone is actually looking at you like you shouldn't be here, kook, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the fact that you feel a little more welcome with that transparency, transparency I think is great, dude. But like you can be on a mountain bike, right? You can go to like Whistler Bike Park and you can be at the top of the hill and you see, you can see a dude with the dopest bike, the 510 shoes, the fucking fist gloves, the Troy Lee helmet, the Oakley, you know, and he can look, you can look at that guy and be like, oh, he's, he's been riding his whole life. Could yeah. be his first day yeah. ever, right? Surfing's the same. Yeah. Like you go surfing in California or, or the Gold Coast and it's just like, I mean, you could probably tell like people even how they sit on their surfboard and shit. Like, oh, for there's sure. There's definitely like some, there's definitely some giveaways. Oh, yeah. but there's always like the feet not together or something. Yeah, yeah. Or like people, you know, and the, I think the funniest part was surfing, which is kind of indicative of how, how every other sport is, but a little bit more transparent or a little bit more like easy to see when you think that everyone is hawking at you, you know, yeah, you think yeah. that everyone's, you know, when are surfing probably are more than other sports, but mountain biking, they're not moto. They're not unless no. you're getting in the way or crossing or not, Yeah, unless you're doing some like crazy shit. No one cares. And generally not in surfing. If you're out there, even if you're, you know, you're paddling like a frog or something and you, you know, you, as long as you're not getting anyone's way, no one's really going to care. Everyone's yeah. trying to get their own best way of their life. Yeah. So I think we're, we're, we're our own biggest critics and we're always harsh on ourselves, but we're also just so worried that everyone's going to think we're a kook, you know? That was me and Moto too, my whole life. Yeah. For sure. I was just like super self conscious. Like the doing good at a race was more about not looking like a kook to other yeah. people than, than like doing it for the, the right reasons, you know? And it's like, it, it, yeah there's so much and i think that's why it's so important to do these things and if people say i i know there would be so many people listen to this where like yeah their wife would give them a hard time about riding or their parents like man you're 30 years old like are you still why are you going to the track with it? but it's, you do you you but, got it you but got it's it. like there's juice there like yeah. there's a real reason you know like the the jiu-jitsu thing for me like i never felt anxiety in my life like doing a competition in jiu-jitsu like way gnarlier than anything i've ever felt Dude, in my hand entire life. combat with another man like another grown-ass man is like it's about as real as it gets right oh, and there's just you two like a moto race no one is watching all 40 people at the same time yeah then jiu-jitsu there's like one mat and there's two fucking dudes and it's like it's so into and rampage bro like the camera's just on you one run at the top there's no distractions like it's literally we're all watching cam zinc right now is he going to win? Is he going to die? Dude. Like, let's find out in two minutes. Dude, that that one is is for sure. Like, the spotlight's on you. Don't blow it kind of deal. But we're, you're just so friggin' focused that you couldn't care less. But um, the one I did, I did a, like, pretty much Evil Knievel special at Mammoth for oh, uh, that yeah. 100, 100, 100, 100 foot flip. Is is nine years ago. I think that was 14. So almost a decade ago. But that one was all me for an hour long special that was the, <laughs> that was the most pressure i've ever had in my whole entire life because like i always thought the easy thing was you're at a contest and someone's dropping after you someone dropped before you you probably get a second run this was a whole hour dedicated to me don't freaking blow it everyone's <laughs> yeah, yeah. oh we're here and then he just cased it or he crashed you know like it's <laughs> that one was yeah so it's kind of funny you say that the uh, it would it's harder you know for the rampage or these other events that the whole the camera is just on you rather than 39 other riders uh, but i thought that was easy compared to this other one but yeah i don't i don't really want i don't want to do that one again that, one, <laughs> that was the most that was the most stressful stressful week and day day of my life but, what uh, led to that like what was the initial idea it was pretty cool i don't know man i just wanted to you know, we're going total different direction now, but yeah, I just, um, I remember there was a jump build at Woodward West in Tehachapi that was 60 feet. Um, no one really had been flipping 60 foot jumps. I think Joe Parizo did, did one, he flipped that jump once. Um, and then I filmed it and I was like, that was pretty good. I like, I thought that worked really well. I can start to understand that it's not just, adding on monumental lengths every 10 it's still an ellipse and it's still like yeah i don't know it's, it started it started to make more sense the it, physics are the same you're just adding numbers each way yeah and it's not in you know, even if you go 50 percent bigger it's not necessarily 50 percent harder so i yeah. started to kind of 
you know, be, you know, consumed by that and got, and got on monster the following year. And that was my first goal. Like I want to flip hundred feet. I think this is possible. Skateboards are jumping 70 feet now. Like why can't we flip a hundred feet on a mountain bike? And which think about where we're at today in 2023. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> like, whoa, dude. Yeah. Tom, uh, Tom, I went 120. Um, and it looked great. Like it was smooth and you know, it shows that all right, my, my original goal after doing hundred was I think we could do 150, but then I've, I've gotten knocked out on it and it, I have the jump built in my property It's there, but also there's not the pressure of doing it on a set timeline. Like, yeah. like this ESPN special, which, you know, I, I really appreciated the opportunity and I'm really, you know, in high, like after it was completed, one of the greatest like achievements for me, especially with the buildup and how all the pressure was on me. But that I, as much as I don't want to do it again, I do think I need some sort of like a timeline because I'm like, yeah, I still have the jump. Yeah, I did. I flipped yeah. one. I flipped 110, broke my own re- world record. But uh, I don't. I don't need to do this right now. And so I've kind of given up on 150. I'm like, fuck that. But <laughs> I, I don't know. After watching Tom do 120, I was like, dude, I think 150 is possible. Like, I think, but I'm, I'm trying to set my goals at like 125, maybe 130 uh, for uh, my sandbox edit that I'll try. I was trying to get done this year, but it'll be next year. Um, the, yeah, the, the first one was two years ago or three years ago and been meaning to get a uh, sandbox too. It's just a little bit bigger. Want to do. Carson Storch and I have been talking about doing the biggest three drop would be, which would be like over a 40 foot vertical drop. And, uh, uh, I have a few things that I want to, but I, I don't know, feel really good. But at the same time, I'm like, do I have to do this? Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. like the, but I, I have, I have the motivation, but it's not like just so blind. Like I was there, like, I'm doing this at all costs, but I'm, I'm, I think I'm just going to take my time more with, with building it and, and taking the necessary precautions to make it happen. But I do need some sort of like a, like a definitive date or something or otherwise yeah, it's going to yeah. just keep lingering. Well, that, I think that's like one of the secrets to life as well. And I think that that's probably one of the, one of the things that I've learned the most in the last five years doing like the podcasts and like, and you know, the jujitsu stuff. And then it's got me back into like racing and kind of doing like picking an event, like one off event. And the, the common theme there is accountability. Yeah. You know, and it's like, you kind of, you, in your case with that ESPN special, right? It's like you lump this whole thing on your back and it's known to all these people that I'm taking this on, you know? And for me, it's like the, my life improved dramatically the day that I started this podcast because all of a sudden I wasn't just living in anonymity. Like I wasn't living in the shadows. Like there's, you know, at the start, there's thousands of people watching and then there's hundreds of thousands and then there's millions of people watching. And it's like, you have to live in accordance to the person that you say you're going to be or the person that you say you are in a sense, you know? And then it's like, you talk about, okay, I'm doing world vets. Like I purposely, we, we started talking about it when we did our ride to Cape York, like me and my boys, we got up there and we kind of like got to the tip of Australia and it was that same crew of guys. And they're like, what are we doing next? And I'm like, we're doing world vets. And my buddy had already won it before. I fucking suck at racing, <laughs> you know. Like, so it was, it's a big, it's a big commitment. It's like a year away. And then I just the first thing I did, and I got on the fucking podcast like a week later when I got back, and I just started talking about world vets. And it's like, boys, it's written, it's yeah. done. We are, we are now accountable to all of the people that just listened to that episode. I can't not do this now, you know. And I think that it's the same thing with what you did what you do in all of your career oh i you know? I, oh, I, st- I have been yeah people i'm a call called it uh babe ruth and it you know pointing at the yeah fence, yeah you know, yeah like, and i i think a lot of people want to keep it under wraps and have the element of surprise but i i think subconsciously i needed that accountability when For i sure. like, show up at the course you know even slope style when there was multiple options and like try to spin off the biggest thing that someone else might not even jump like I feel like subconsciously I needed that accountability of like, I said, I'm going to do it. So I can't back out and have the whole week to stew on it, but also have the whole week to be committed and run through it in your head because visualization is fucking everything. Dude. Dude. I remember hearing uh, Sam Hill get, could visualize his run and then have, uh, you know, just sit in a chair, no headphones, no nothing and visualize his run and then after he would race it would be within a couple seconds that's 
fucking mind blowing. Was that not one of the coolest things like ever said on anything ever? Yeah, like, was that said, on this podcast, yeah, yeah, dude? Yeah. I couldn't believe that because like I'm same, I, dude. I'm I'm huge on it, but I've um, I don't know. It's not time. It's not. It's it's more about visualizing the trick. But I was like, dude, that is some sorcery shit right there. Incredible. Oh man, when he when he said that, like that would to me. It's like you know, you know they say never meet your heroes. I'm yeah. Like, Fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> like that dude's my yeah. hero, Dude. and that right there is why he's my hero. And, and he's the definition of walk softly and carry a big stick. Like he's just you, you know, just looks like a mellow dude. That he is you know, done, the mellow, done, like the done most get, mellow dude. Doesn't get too excited about anything, but just does shit no one could even comprehend. I, I love, love I love when people. This is one of my like one of my pleasures of doing the podcast is like that, like finding that getting like, into their head. Yeah. No one taught him that. No, no one taught him that, you know, that is him. Like he, and I think again, like it comes from this anxiety that you feel when you're putting yourself out there. And it's like, he knows that he's Sam Hill, you know, like people expect him to win. There's like a thing that comes with, being Sam Hill. There's a thing that comes with being Cam Zink. There's a thing that comes with being Travis Pastrana. And it's like, you put yourself in this box and in this like dark, weird place where it's like the eyes are on you and you've said that you're doing this thing or people know that like expect, they expect you to do this thing. And then the brain goes to work. And for Sam, it's like he, he, he visualized to the point where, and that, that's like meditation. That's mm-hmm. think of the freedom in that space, bro. Yeah. Think about being in your room alone at night and just over and over. And I, and I, I think I said like, Oh, what happens if you like lost thought? He said, I just start again until I could do it. You know? And it's like, dude, to be that person that's wants something that bad that's been backed into a corner that much to where like you're forcing that from yourself and i mean this year at rampage like that backflip like that there had to be your version of that for that flip oh for sure i mean like i it's refreshing to hear him say that he just started over because it's um i remember hearing a cirque de soleil performer in some article about mindset or visualization saying that they visualize what they're going to do. And if there's a hiccup in that visualization, then that's what they need to work on. Like that moment, transition, hold, whatever it is. So I've, I've always tried to just figure out my run through or whatever, you know, the, the main feature, the main trick that I'm going to do and what line you're going to take into it. How hard are you going to, we're going to just go down to feeling the takeoff. And it always takes a long time. Like it's never like, all right, I'm going to visualize this portion and it, it never comes even usually the first day it's like i could sure i could kind of blitz through in my head and visualize but to truly feel like feel it and like go through it to where i'm actually like living it takes like a lot it takes a lot of effort and a lot of times and i think kind of what we were saying at the beginning of this like now is the easy part all there's all this prep work even for a podcast but then when we just sit down and talk this is the easy part yeah and especially when you're when you have the all the prep that goes into you know that finals are going to be on this day you're going to be standing in this spot um like this year i even took um so like we're living on maui and i can't ride that kind of stuff there and i had to come back for like a week right before i went out to utah and I was like, I'm just going to flip this and I'm just going to make this a positive of having to be here. And every morning I sat on my porch, I'd get my coffee and everything uh. before, before the kids, before the kids wake up, I have kind of a longer morning program. Like I drink 32 ounces of water with some sea salt and I got it like, so like I got to get up early if I want anything under, uninterrupted. So I'd sit on our, on our balcony and I'd just visualize it. And I even got to the point where I was like, oh, I'm going to play last year's start like of like Cam McCall this is this is Cameron Zink about to drop in so then I'm like when you get into that moment it's just you know it all is just autonomous like you don't have to think about anything you've been in that moment before even though I've know that I've been in that start gate many times but to just have it fresh when I'm visualizing that you're just gonna go full autopilot and fucking blackout and you're gonna you're going to lace this shit. <laughs> yeah. So like it, uh, but it, the funny thing about the flip is I dude, I have measurements for the, for the ending angle and how long I'm trying, you know, you can use a, an angle, the angle finder on your phone. And like, I try to get everything as exact as I know I've flipped this, or I've done this before, or this is this big of a gap, but I wanted to do a flip can off that jump. That was my plan the whole time. And then 
I came off and got just a dead pop, and I think a lot of it was to do with the lip breaking, which yeah. has never freaking happened to me yeah. before. That was heavy. Dude, so heavy. And just watching how much, like, setting up wide so I didn't risk blowing, like, the first run into the soft stuff. And just, like, I I am, like, really proud of myself when I watched that shit of all the corrections that I didn't even realize I was even doing and hopping over the roller and setting up wide and still leaning, like, um, but I, yeah, I kind of blew it. Like I, I wanted to pull harder and then get a better rotation and do a flip can off of that. But, it, you know, luckily I didn't need to, but, uh, that, that was, you know, at least a week of sitting in my, on my, on my deck every morning, visualizing that, you know, so when I got there and it's still kind of shit hit the fan, but it was probably a lot to do with the lip. Um, but also I kind I kind of blew it, but it still worked out just, you know, it's uh, I don't know. I, I love I love that shit. I love the prep work and then and then like how much goes into it behind the scenes that oh that's just talent you know like that was a lot of fucking work which is talent at the end of the day. I don't I mean I think we've just been misusing the word talent for so damn long. It's usually just the byproduct of the amount of work and prep and and visualization and and time and energy you put into it and all the obstacles you've overcome as well. I mean. I think yeah, skill is is um, yeah, just kind of misrepresented, I guess. Oh, bro, I'm the biggest believer in that now. Like, just like the the biggest, and to hear you say that, it's such an amazing description. And like, you know, to play the sound, like, there's so much. Like, uh, I always say to to people that I come in contact with, and like, I, I love trying to like, I love trying to be a vibe guy for people, you know. And I always say like, just intention, bro. Just yeah. be intentful. Do things with a purpose just the dumbest shit in your life do it with a purpose and like just be like if someone asks you why you do something give them the reason yeah i do this because of this you know it's like there's there's so much in in that you know and it's like to to play that that might not work for everybody that might you know what i mean but it's like to just that's purposeful that's mm-hmm. intent you've got to take that you've, and there are all those wins that you like stack up in your mind those tiny little wins to where you can say to your wife and you can look her in the face and be like hey i'm i could die for sure okay let's let's not let's let's not leave the elephant in the room unattended but i can tell you right now that's not going to happen like i feel so good about this and it is those moments it's those 10 minutes every day and it's like the intention to do it like you've left no stone unturned and then the other thing that's so cool that you say is like your body the mind is not as involved dude physically that's exactly where my head was going like and i've got crazy examples of this that i've felt in my own life where there's like some stuff's come from meditation and like a lot of meditation And then there's other stuff that's come from like writing and especially jujitsu. Like I have this one, there was like this one time where I like did an armbar on a dude where, and it was like a fucking war. Like the gym I trained in in Australia was like Brazilian old school pojada. That's like the, in Brazilian it means every day we go to war. And so like you walk in this gym and it was like hard to deal with, right? But you knew every day you were going there. I had like fucking physical anxiety, like sweating in the car. And I go there every single day, like sometimes twice a day. Like that's how gnarly it was. And I remember armbarring this dude off like I don't know what happened. Like I just don't know. I just woke up and the dude was tapping to an armbar and it's like the, a good dude. It was a war and my body just did its thing. And I was not involved at all. And it was so clear to me that I was not involved. And there's so many more times now, like jumping for me, like I'm not great at jumping. We didn't grow up doing it. And then it's like all the jumps that I hit though, it's like, I'm not thinking like you grease these jumps to perfection. And it's like, for me, it might be like, I go to parlor and I'm on the big track for the first time. And I'm like, dude, you got three laps to jump these jumps or you're not jumping any of them. And it's like, in the moment the mind you're trying to think that the mind is the thing that's going to make you jump this jump and it's not it's not involved at all the mind the mind has the mind's basically almost a zero yeah basically zero involved in actually doing it. everything happens if you let it yeah and, and i bet that's a big feeling oh for sure i, w- I want to write a book about it dude i <laughs> i did the first time i ever experienced anything like it was uh it was like crankworks oh five 
Um, there was uh, the big Giro trailer at the bottom, the final feature, and at the time it was a huge drop. No one had spun anything that big, and it's pretty high speed. And I called it at the beginning of the week, and people were like, no way, no way. So I, the accountability, and then I went over it every practice run. This is like when a lot of shit we didn't practice because you're just going to – if you're going to do it, you're going to do it. You have to do it in the game. Yeah. And there wasn't as much rhythm to it, so you didn't have to have speed after. And it was the last feature, but – Every practice run I went through and visualized three in it every single time. And I got up and then I would like, it would be perfect speed, no brake, no pedal, no pump, no, not like I had it dialed perfect. And in my run, for some freaking reason, I brake tapped when I got up top and I remember popping to spin it like, what the fuck did I just do? Why did I brake tap? And I just greased it. And I was all, dude, my subconscious is way sicker at riding than I am. <laughs> Yeah, like yeah. dude and then i it's it's kind of the uh, similar like different labels or almost levels of it of like the flow state or you know like uh being in the proverbial zone or blacking out or like but just no matter what it's coming from your subconscious it's like your the front of your mind and your direct consciousness and all the shit that's going on is only going to kind of sandbag what you know like your your subconscious can actually do and all the muscle memory and everything working so the the best thing to kind of prepare yourself is is the visualization because then you can almost wipe off the table like all right i need to think about all this right now like no that's the last thing you need to do you've already thought about it so at least you can i think that's the biggest like benefit of of the premeditative kind of you know visualizing because then you can at least check that part off and mm. then give you a little bit more like confidence in fo and letting your subconscious do its thing because yeah, best rides I've ever had. There was no fucking thinking. It was like the mammoth flip, dude. I literally blacked out. And then after, as I was landing, I was like, dude, it's done. I was two months of prep work and all this, all this, all the, everything else that went into it is done. And I, I just like, did it. I didn't even fucking remember it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I absolutely love that shit. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe one day I'll find a, a good co-author or whatever to write, to write a book on or something. But that's like, that's my, my, my favorite things in life. And it kind of back to the, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is where I'm, this is what I'm good at. This is what I've been training for. This has been building like this. I've, I agree that there are risks, but I think that my, my equation of, of likelihood outweighs those and I'm fucking send it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like it's, it's such a cool place to be in. And I, that's probably one of the bigger things where I was trying to connect with, with other athletes and, and other sports that, you know, they're, they're letting, they're, they're letting it do the work they've yeah. already put in, they've already put in the prep and all, and all the other due diligence. But then when it comes time to actually race or compete or do whatever sort of kind of world's first or, or they're just letting it just happen. Yeah. Pretty special place to be. I mean, I completely agree. And it's like, I would, I would always, and I mean, I've gone back now, like, I guess I've had different like revelations in my life or whatever over the last like five or six years. And I'd go back and I'd listen to episodes of the podcast with like Robbie Madison. Like, you know, I think it was maybe 10th. Or he's 11. an interesting mind, man. For oh, sure. Crazy, bro. Like he's, he's all you guys are special. That's why I love my job. You know, like there's just some special motherfuckers that have just, I appreciate that. you've all figured something out. You know, you're all, you've, you've all got this special thing that your unique circumstances, like forced out of you like the sam hill visualization and you know what you go through and, what, and, we, and we all like learn from each other too you know in bits and pieces you know so it helps like the whole conglomerate of action sports and other sports to like help then elevate each other it is so cool oh man definitely and, and you're kind of dissecting all that right you get the i always i always said joe rogan is like has the sickest job because he has the opportunity and privilege to talk to all these amazing people and he, he's just like going through the greatest master class each yeah, day of their yeah. field, you know. So for you to, to lump it all together for all these sports that we love so much, you know, it's uh, I, that's that's awesome. Well, and it's selfish for me, you know, because like for my whole life, like, and I would think about this, and and it's it's the theme, I guess. I was asking questions that I feel like I've got the answers to now, and now it's like a matter of living my whole life in accordance to this value system now that i've like okay i've figured this out i've i've tested i've confirmed it with you and robert and like all it like th all right, this is what it is so it's like now how do i live my whole life like that you know because 
I, I spent my whole life, like, everyone has their tra- childhood traumas and the, the harshness of their own upbringing, you know, like, the hardest thing you've ever been through is the hardest thing you've ever been through. And it's like, Moto was always an escape. And I knew from a young age that I was like, I wanted to escape my real life and do this thing, even though I wasn't particularly good at it. And that question burned at me for my whole life. And I think that that was the question that, like every podcast it sort of goes back to that or it did for a long period of time but it's like you don't want peace of mind you want peace from mind and it's like I was just I wanted to go riding because my life was kind of shit for a lot as a 17 year old kid that had never had sex never had a girlfriend like didn't have any money wasn't good like your life fucking sucks to you at that point you know but then you've got like in comparison this, in though, com- right? yeah, yeah like at the time like I said it's like the worst thing you've ever been through is like the worst thing you've uh-huh. ever been through so in my head I'm like fuck life sucks what do I want to do moto that's it that's the thing but then it's like you finish it and then I'd be that introspective kind of deep weird kid and I'm like but why like why does that make me want to do this and it's like then you start to learn like you know you you talk to Robbie and I I remember saying to Travis there was like another really cool moment in the podcast where I asked Travis about like jumping out of the plane without a parachute and I'm like it's so and I, I, I can't remember exactly what I said but it was I was like is it is it that you've got so much noise and there's the demons and there's so much going on in your head that the moment you actually step out of that plane, there's just like freedom from that. Because in my mind, like that's kind of what I was going through in a sense. But it, to me, it wasn't jumping out of a plane without a parachute. To me, it was just going riding, you know, like the act of that. And, you know, he he had, like, a bit of a mind-blown moment where he was like, fuck, bro, I've never, like, I've never been able to really explain it. So I think we all want that in a sense, and it's like, this is our outlet. And I think that the real thing, and nowadays I try and tell people, is like, you can have that all the time. Like, your life can be that, like that same peace from mind. Like, when you understand, like, what you've figured out where it's like, your mind just gets in the way of doing that your body will do it it's like you can be in the car with your kids and your kids can be like singing to some random shit or like making some funny movie ref and it's like you can let the mind go and fully be absorbed in the moment in the way that you are pulling up to a rampage back like obviously i think that the reason it's like i would call it like a forced flow or like a forced whatever that state whatever who however you want to call that state but it's forced like there's crazy consequences that require you to have that level Mm -hmm. of focus because you know you can die you know like there's you've again you've gone through and it's like there's so much pressure that it's it's like a diamond it's like it gets squeezed into that pressure is a privilege yeah yeah and and i think that that's what forces you there and so we go to writing because it's like you're gonna be forced you've got like i remember there was one crazy time that i rode in cairns like where i grew up i so i was born in cairns and so slipperies i don't know if you've ever heard of that but it's like this crazy jungle it's just all roots and it's always wet because it's in the rainforest and it's like the fucking sketches it's so much fun but it's like gnarly and i remember just full flow state like i hadn't rode a mountain bike in years went there with my uncle sent it down there and i was just like bro that's fucked up like i was in flow because my body was scared i was gonna die (laughs) like basically sink sink or swim (laughs) yeah yeah so you've like so but that freedom that you feel from that it's the same mind yeah you're the same thing at all times right so that freedom that you experience that peace from mind that we're all trying to get to it's like that's always available and you can you can experience that with a beautiful view. You can experience that cooking dinner. You can experience that just listening to your kids. Like that same thing or like the goal of what we're trying to do is just always available. And so now it's like for me, it's like, okay, I've figured that part out. I've figured this. Now the challenge is to live like that all the time. Life is a ride, you know? Yeah, the some guy that went on, I'm horrible with names, but he went on Rogan recently and said that like, the, a peaceful mind can always be at peace you know like if you're yeah. truly a peaceful mind then you could be able to let overlook that shit over let like the kids 
you know, causing like the most hazardous form of driving to be like, <laughs> I could still drive peacefully, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But it's, so it's interesting to say you're, you're like, you know, supplement to that is that you can force that, you know? Yes. So to, I don't, I, it didn't, I didn't identify with it that much. I was just trying to like, you know what? I can be peaceful like all the time if I'm truly at peace, but like you could, but also to just force yourself into it maybe that'll be the new way you know maybe maybe you just get so accustomed to because i i am, am not the best at taking implementing this this mind that i that I, I, the greatest mindset of my time yeah or like of you know personally yeah, peak you yeah peak me and you know spreading that across other ways but um stephen kotler wrote that uh the rise of superman book yeah, and yeah. like uh that's the kind of thing that I was always like, okay, I, they're doing case studies on me and then I should be able to, I should be the best at trying to spread this cross, but it's way easier said than done. Right. But I do like how you're saying that you can force yourself into it and then it could just hopefully become the norm to where you're just a G all the time. Like I, I, th I think the, the most, uh, I don't know, mild, like mellow headed, like assertive humans are usually the old guys, right? Yeah. The, the, yeah. the old dogs that have the, the perspective, the experience, and they just can perceive things as benevolent when, you know, us, you know, us, we're like, taking it super personally. Us, us amateur young yeah. guys are just like, what the, like, yeah, like yeah. but they're just, you know, relaxed like a, like a Buddha or something. So I, uh, yeah, I like, what I've just learned today of, you know, trying to spread it, spread it across and maybe even force it. And, and, then like having something special and being able to experience like, all right, let's try to make this, you know, throughout the rest of our day, the rest of our week and the rest of our life and just keep getting better at it. Yeah. Well, it's this, it's, it's, if it's available to you in that moment, it's like you're conscious, right? Yeah. Like you're, and, and I think like what you're doing and what you're describing with like a rampage flip is like it's unconscious or the hundred foot flip. Mm -hmm. It's like, it is, a, it, there is an ability to be purely conscious. So you're conscious when you're doing the backflip, but like the you that you think you are or the you that you relate to on a day-to-day -day basis wasn't a part of that. So it's like, okay, your conscious experience is there whether you're thinking or not. So it's like that state of consciousness, if you strip everything else away from it, all the thoughts, all the ego, all the bills, all the fucking families, whatever, like I'm this, I'm that, I need that. If you strip that away, like you're left with that state, the mm -hmm. conscious state that did all the best things in your life. So it's like, I think when you've experienced it enough times and when you've experienced, it's like you hit yourself on the fucking thumb with a hammer enough time. Like, you know what that experience like gets you and you're like, that's always available if I, if yeah. I say. so it's just kind of like the reverse of that, you know, it's just like, and, and believing like in that stressful moment in traffic or in that stress that there is a version of you that is just purely conscious and that there would be a step, there's a way to remove all the thoughts and then all the baggage that comes with those thoughts. Like that's just what you are all the time yeah and it's kind of it, it kind of contradicts another one that i've always gravitated toward um search for search for app the i was the guy that had a had who worked at google and they hired him to pretty much you know meditate teach people meditation because that's going to create compassion that's going to create peace that's going to create everything so uh search inside yourself i think it's called but he, he just said all these emotions and picture them like a river and as soon as you can look down on the river and, and pull yourself out of the raging river of, you know, frapping out like down a waterfall or something, as soon as you can pull yourself up and like, all right, those are my emotions. Those are ripping. It's kind of funny. This is almost contradicting that. Whoa. But you like almost want to go back to like your, your better self. Like it's almost like the opposite of it to where like your better self is like the mild place and maybe all these emotions are raining down and you just need to get a freaking umbrella and get get out of the way of it so that is like so it's perfect right so there's uh this is getting like more deep meditation theory side of things like uh -huh. there's people that have thought about this shit like i'm there's nothing new i'm saying here like this is all for thousands of 20, years 2600 years ago the buddha like figured all this shit out so you would say like so there would be like and I'll try not to hijack it for too long, but it's like there's du I'm in. there's dualistic mindfulness, right? So if, if I was like, you're trying to meditate right now and I'm being a meditation teacher, you'd come to me and you'd be like, okay, so there's, there's the river and the thoughts. So you want me to be above the river and looking at the thoughts? Like 
that's like one way to do it. And, and I think that's like the way that in a, in a practice, like if you're going to like a meditation retreat or whatever, that's, that's what they'll say, like focus on the breath. Like, so there's like, there's you and then there's the breath. So they call it like dualistic. So there's like subject and object. But then, so what you just described, like, so you figured it out that it's like, okay, that's kind of, there's like a weird contradiction there because it sort of is the same thing, right? Yeah. So what you need to think of is like, there's no, the, the subject and the object are within consciousness. Like, and your what we are is like, we're this weird fucking organism in the universe that knows we're having an experience. There's not like this table for, for what I can tell, like this table's in the universe, like it's in real, like it's real, but it doesn't know that it's in the universe. It doesn't know that it's real. There's nothing going on that would tell this table that it's having an experience. And then there's things that are alive that don't know they're having an experience. So like you could think of like a fucking, an oyster. Like as far as we can tell, like there's no nervous system. There's nothing that's like telling that oyster that it's an oyster having an experience. But what we have is conscious experience. So I know that I'm a thing in this room and I'm like having an experience. I can like relate my experience and then I can, I can be like, Hey Cam, like, so all right, we're in this room where you're having this experience too. Right. So like, that's our massive key point of difference and no one thinks about it. You know, like we go through our whole life, like just not even really questioning like our place of like the hierarchy of things and like kind of what that means. Right. So like all of this is to say that, yeah, you can say that I'm this, I'm all right. The, the traditional way they would say it is like, okay, I'm in just this river of emotion and the fear and anger and happiness and sadness. And it's all just the same thing. It's just this fucking river that, that I'm in and I'm in this raft, I'm getting thrown around. And then it's like the, that Google dude's like, just swim across the river and stand on the shore and watch the river go by. But it's like, that is still in a thing. Like that's still in this. Yeah, just a way to conceptualize it, right? Yeah, so that's still like object, subject. Like you're still in that. Uh, there's, there's still something that's bigger than what you're saying. So it's like, yeah, you've stepped outside the river, but that's still inside the container of like you're just what you're aware of. So then it's like, okay, the next step from that is like step away from that and notice that you're not a thing on the side of the river. There's just the river. That's it. And it's like, that's when you can really dip out on that. There doesn't have to be a a meditator meditating. There doesn't have to be a dude standing on the river, watching the river. There's just what's happening right now. And like, as a person that's had kids, there's a point where your kids don't know English. They don't know who you are. They don't know what they are. They're just fucking born and they're in the world and they're kicking and screaming. They have no fucking clue what's going on. That's just experience experiencing. And then over time you add like they learn their name. They learn some English words. They can. And then that's this process of like a, a, a human is born, like a self is born, a person is born. But if you strip all that shit back, your kid is just still the same experience experiencing you know and i think that that's what you're feeling in like that crazy flow state of like when the mind goes blank like you're just experiencing you're an experience experiencing and then after that there's all the levels get added of like i'm cam zinc i'm a mountain biker this was on espn this was but you can remove all those layers and that's what you experience in that very moment yeah and just to just be right yeah i've i've love the schooling and i was like the the idea of well you thought you were smart until you didn't know what, until you were taught what you didn't know and you don't know what you don't know and how many layers are there of this and especially especially something that i loosely try to try to understand and meditate and there's i'm sure that there's been times to when i've like uh i don't know who he was but he was saying try to imagine like the back of your head and you're just mm. not even there like there's been i've been uh I've, I've gotten a glimpse of it, but it's a lifelong thing, right? To just keep learning about, about how to just be and almost go back to just being nothing, right? To, yeah. to just being without consciousness and, and, uh, yeah, and get to enjoy 
these amazing moments and that amazing state of mind throughout your life without having to risk your life or, you know, not that you saying, I want to just go live this and be in peace and not do all the things that I love to do, but it wouldn't, yeah, it'd be pretty righteous to be able to have that when, you know, you're just hanging out with the kids on the porch or sitting on the beach and just being, and just being present. Right. And, um, yeah, being present, the uh, the best part of life and not letting everything just get clogged up and hit you like a raging river, I guess. Yeah. And you can just, I think just knowing that you can have it, I yeah, don't, I don't yeah. think we get told that. Yeah. You know, like you It's prob- a fairly new concept, right? Well, you're probably going to be able to go away from this conversation. Like you'll probably be in the car after this and just be like, I'm going to try that. And then yeah. you're like, fuck, it's actually it. Yeah. Like I just, I think that's, and there's people like whenever people talk to me about this sort of shit, I'm just like, man, honestly, it's not even about fucking quote unquote meditating. It's about understanding just the, some concepts and then your job in life and this is my fucking huge in relate like relationships is just two egos Mm -hmm. you know and like an ego is like what you an ego wants more of what it wants and less of what it doesn't and then you've got in your case i do i've only got me and my wife in my household to manage like you've got four egos to manage you know so it's like you 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 can start to just i guess with a little bit of knowledge you can just see the way that things like the way that these egos are interacting and then you can be like oh I, i'm actually a thing before i'm an ego so yeah. like i'll let the other people ego while i'd be the thing before the ego you know and so just i think the secret of it is like do enough work or do enough have enough of these experiences understand your role in these experiences and then let that just be like the guidebook in your life to just then when you feel the pinch of like wanting to react or blow up like because that's my i just fucking blow up sometimes you know like we'll have a me and my wife will be having a thing or she'll be like she just she loves asking a million questions and sometimes i'm just fucking over it you know like i don't i've been talking all day i've been thinking all day sometimes i just want to sit on the freeway and just like do nothing and then that that's the worst thing that you can do to a person that's just like genuinely oh what's this building where's this for what's this where's that's it and it's just like you don't have distance from your reactions like you just act and you just react and it's like the the secret to life is like trying to understand that there's a state that you can exist in that's like not that and your life just becomes a practice of and you do it subconsciously like your morning routine and your you know for me it's like i make a coffee first thing and i make i make an athletic greens first thing every morning and it's like i try and do that without thinking i try and do that without thinking about my day and all, you know yeah just oh, because your body knows how to make a coffee you do yeah. it every day your body knows how to do a 360 off a drop like you've done it that many times like you can just let go yeah and social media is the worst or to don't don't even pick it up don't even look at it in the morning just go through some peace until you're going to be dragged down by these things throughout the day yeah it uh the the autonomy is the is the best place to be even like i guess especially in the morning right like just to get get a nice little rhythm going and uh, other than that yeah it's uh then that then everything else starts kicking in so i guess the next battle is to try to carry it more carry it longer longer, carry it longer yeah. yeah what what's your like how long have you been a morning routine guy for i'm always very interested in hearing people's morning routines because it's so big yeah it is and i and i've always just been so against morning routines and like, i'm <laughs> like that's why i love my life that's why i love my job because yeah, the spontaneity yeah. i was like, the exact same and it, but then at some point you're like all right i have to do something or i'm not going to get anything done like i have businesses to run and i have kids to take care of and those can't happen at the same time in the morning they need attention and I don't want to be like on the computer like half in half out you know so I'm like all right I need so I don't know I guess probably right around first chit like uh, Ayla was born in 2013 uh like around this time of year that's probably right around then I can't put a put like a hard date on it but it's got to be somewhere around then and uh, I still try to neglect most schedules you know as as much as possible and yeah uh, because we're so contingent on the weather, right? And, yeah. and even, even moto and, and surfing and mountain biking, and, you know, we can't have wind. It's, um, it's so, I, I need to leave huge open blocks for the things that I love to do so much. So try to structure as little as possible. That's kind of just the, the morning routine and, and probably just going to bed, like put away the phone at least an hour or two before you're about to go to bed and plug it in and in different room, you know, and yeah. things like that. But the morning routine involves some stretching that, I don't do every single day, but 
Uh, it's something that I've been, you know, kind of cultivating for the better part of a decade or more to, you know, I, I need to add in some prime risk now because now I had this wrist surgery and now I had a new shoulder, you know, and, yeah. and uh, I've got a pretty good little little system that takes under two minutes and addresses everything. So it's just adding little, little things here and there. Um, drink 32 ounces of water with a little, little bit of sea salt, right? And then wait 20 minutes before you do anything else and flush out your kidneys and everything and uh, little things like that. Um, but yeah, I try to have some sort of like, I don't know, like goal setting that they're just micro yeah. goals in the morning yeah. and then get into, you know, know that you accomplished at least something and you set yourself up. So for that's your, like a daily goal. Yeah. That like I want to do this. Today, I want to do that today. Yeah. And then, and then, then I feel better about the whole middle part, like the bulk of the day of, all right, now I can dedicate the whole next five hours to riding or surfing or doing whatever. Or if I have to, you know, I hate being on the computer, but I have to design this and get back to invoicing this or, you know, creating a, a like right now creating a dealer book for census and I, those are i don't have to do it today but you know i i need to set some time and then, yeah. just, and then just smash it out but uh yeah uh, again still trying to neglect the schedule as long as i can but uh i, I need to yeah kind of mornings and evenings so uh what was the move to maui about too because i feel like that's probably a massive influence on like the way that you live your life now in a sense yeah my wife just hates the cold so that's pretty much what summed it up i <laughs> promised her a long time ago um i didn't think my i'd still be riding a bike for a living at 37 i didn't think i would be capable or necessarily be able to um but uh so i promised her a long time ago that we would move there because she lived on oahu for a year oh sick yeah yeah so i was like all right man of my word and you know i think it'll be sick i the thing I love to do the most that I don't get to do is surfing. Like yeah. I suck at sur like until moving there, I can really suck at surfing. And I, you know, I'd been doing it for 15 years, but once or twice a year, you know? So I was like, all right, there's some pros to this. The riding's probably not going to be that great, but then it turns out the riding is pretty good. There's a sick moto track there. Um, I got a, I just have a 250 F there. And, um, so I can spearfish and surf and moto and mountain bike. And I, I absolutely love it. But now she wants to move down here. She wants to move to San Clemente. So, uh, it, I get it. Cause I could better for my daughter's dance and these yeah, things yeah. and, uh, better for whatever, uh, sports crew wants to play. And it's kind of halfway between like lifestyle wise and ge geographically. So, um, who knows, maybe we'll be orange County residents in the next year or so, but, uh, Maui is amazing so far like the greatest sense of community that i've ever yeah. felt and people like they say it's gonna maori's either gonna reject you or accept you and i feel like we've been well accepted we have uh great friends in in all these sports that i do and friends with similar age kids and just such a good community um i love it and i would like to at least you know that'll be kind of a second home for forever hopefully mm. um trying to trying to make it work with all the all the real estate prices and the and then you know interest rates and everything so well um yeah in a perfect world if we got paid super crust money i'd have a place there in reno and tahoe and and san Clemente and everything you know but try to make it work and for the kids i bet it's just epic to be in yeah. that world like there's just man there's something very I don't know, wholesome is probably like the most overhyped, like it, it, attached word, but fucking wholesome being in Hawaii, dude. Yeah, and having, uh, I guess, like too much to do in Reno. I always like just running around strung out, like I got to do this, got to do this, got to do this. I, I can ride moto and do this and then go take the boat out in the same day. Like, I Yeah, can. dude, Reno is pretty sick, eh? Dude, I love it. Like, yeah. And I always said Reno 911 keeps the kooks out because it, it was used to be less, you know, like less of a destination. And now people are starting to realize it's like, dude, Reno is dope. Like, yeah. especially with, you know, Reno combined with Tahoe and just being on the edge of the Sierras and, uh, never a dull moment and just, you know and no one goes downtown and that's what people think of reno as or vegas but it's the it's such a good outdoor town uh tons of lakes tons of good riding mountain moto uh moto like moto tracks as well as as uh like off-road trail riding and whatnot and there's a good shifter cart track and uh, you know you, get, you buy a membership you get to go spin laps whenever you want and uh but yeah maui is like slow down and but still have all these other extracurricular activities that um fill up make me feel full and uh and and fill up the day and that i can enjoy with the kids and both of them are surfing ayla's 
you know, paddling into pretty sweet waves on a on a six shortboard. Annie uh, Annie Riker just gave her a board that she painted. That's so cool. So sick. Um, and then um, crew like crew's ridden overhead waves, but I still got to push them in. Uh, pretty sick, man. Yeah, I think for a kid, just the, those years are just so formative of like your personality and what you yeah. can kind of take on and what you think you can do and achieve and and there's like a and culture right just getting to experience a completely different culture than reno and it's different man like i spent um i before the podcast i was like a filmer and um i did a project on hawaii where with malcolm stewart and josh Kasher and we like built a track in Kauai and i so i pretty much lived there for like six weeks to to make this project happen and met like lifelong friends in that time and just good people oh man like it's kind of a weird place though like kind of some of the worst people and then also some of the best people in yeah. a sense like there's there's definitely some i got weird vibes like i mean we had the water truck driver shot with a fucking machine gun one day oh, like just some weird shit like and then yeah so i mean there was definitely the worst but the best at the same time you know i, I think it's if they, if they get the notion that you're taking and not giving or if you're not if if you're an outsider trying to make money off of something yeah. you know but if you i don't know, go just go into like a coach my son's t-ball and we help with uh some help in lahaina and we help like if you if you help it's well recognized and it's you know they well received well received yeah. and you uh some yeah they 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 pay attention you know if they see you or you're hiring locals say you're gonna build a house and you hire locals yep. or something it's it's not as blasphemous as hire just bringing in a team to build your mansion you know like it's they 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 pay attention and if and if you are you know living with the, with the land and with the locals and living you know with the community and helping and contributing to the community then you know you're going to be well respected and and uh, yeah it's a great place to live yeah and, and that 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 was the vibe that i got there is that there was people where it's like okay this has got to help the community like mm-hmm. no matter what and that's lost in a lot of places in the world these Everywhere days. Everywhere else is just grow, 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 you know, yeah, expand, yeah. expand. And they're like, we're not going to build this highway or extend that because then that's going to create, you know, more reason for people. You know, they're like, we welcome a little bit of traffic because it kind of maybe it keeps the kooks out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it was a cool experience to be there. And like, and there's there's people that uh, you talk about like intention, like there's cool people that like go, especially Maui. I feel like Maui is like probably one of those places where it's like you're getting guys that are like going there to live a certain type of way and mm-hmm. they're like okay this is how i live this is who i am this is who i want to be and like this is the place where i'm gonna do it you know yeah yeah yeah. i just want to go bow hunt and not wear shoes and you know <laughs> go surfing and then provide for auntie and uncle and you know go go talk story with auntie and uncle <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's so funny picking up on all the, the little nuances but yeah you just you know uh great great people great community um, a place that I, I'd like to call at least partial home for forever and be just more in more and more ingrained in it, you know, like build trails there. We're working, um, trying to get some on the Upper West Side and develop a whole new b- mountain bike trail system by Lahaina to help them, you know, have, you know, bring up, give the kids something to do, provide some experiences and get them on two wheels and, um, you know, hopefully be able to just keep expanding it. Cause like, what can I bring to the table? I'm, yeah. I, I could bring something, you know, pertinent to mountain biking, you know, so that's what I'm going to try to provide, um, and show everyone, you know, how, what, what a couple trails on this side of the Island can do and help, help keep building and contributing from there. Yeah. That's sick. So, uh, should we do a bit of soupy bench racing before you got to go? Cause I'm, yeah, pro- we're probably, dude. we're probably getting pretty close. What time are you going to be yeah, out of here? I, I think, think we're all right. Yeah. We're getting close. We've got to get on a flight here in a little bit, but I think we're all right. All right. So what, what are you most excited for right now in pro moto, the world of pro moto? Give me your takes. Dude, Tomac, no doubt about it. Like, <sighs> I mean, dude, it's like to, to just see, like, I mean, Sexton had him at one of the world supercrosses, right? But, uh, I, he's not going to, he's, I think jets just too much better. I don't, I don't think sex, I think Sexton is going to win a race or two, but Tomac has that other, like bit, that extra superhuman grit that like yeah. no one has. Like, yeah. like, I don't even know. If, I don't even know if jet has jet has so much finesse and is just so dialed. And I, I kind of want to refrain from using just talent. Yeah, I was going to say, we can't use talent anymore. No, but <laughs> yeah. it, but it's like his, the way he rides is just, 
like from the years of hard work and going going to Europe and, and his whole upbringing has developed like one of the greatest fastest smoothest like least chance he's going to crash riders to ever do it right but uh, and going so fast he looks like hill right like hill when you watch like a lot of yeah, his runs dude. unless he's drifting foot out like you'd kind of look like he's going slow because he's so smooth and he doesn't move on the bike as much and then you see the timer you're like jesus christ dude well what's crazy is his head doesn't move yeah yeah so a jet has that and he and almost even a different style of like just hopping and avoiding bumps and flowing but like i heard it on uh one of the, one of the pro the, the outdoor rounds this year they're like is he messing with it is he charging and then they kind of just see how everyone's sifting not catching up and he's pulling away and they're like Oh, he's not messing with him. He's actually just looks that damn smooth, dude. Yeah. So, yeah. but I think that Tomac will rise to the occasion no matter what era he raced in, no matter who else is on the starting gate. I think that he will be able to latch on and, you know, it might take a couple of races, it might take five rounds to figure out, but I know that he will be able to figure it out and be there with him and challenge. And I'm just really looking forward to, to seeing him line up together, but then also him rise to the occasion and elevate himself and then see how close they are on their best day. You know, it's going to be, it's going to be the RC Stewart battles. You know, there's, there's just a couple rounds and I, and I don't have the best memory to remember which race, but there was a couple. I'm like, these guys are riding faster than any human ever thought they could yeah. ride a dirt bike. They were riding faster than they thought they could ride a dirt yeah, bike. Yeah. So that I, th- I think that he's going to be able to elevate it and not have the, I don't know the the mistake Sexton has that I guess Tomac kind of had those earlier on. Like, uh, but he's such a polished freaking human. That's one of the things that, like, I mean, he said he's going to do the podcast at some point. Sick. And it's one of the things that I just want to know is, like, what happened? What yeah. changed? Because he wasn't Eli Tomac no. for the longest time. Like, the Eli Tomac that we will never forget. Like, the Eli Tomac that will go down in history as the one of the gnarliest dudes ever on a dirt bike was not always that guy yeah and then he just figured it out and it's like what what was it what changed what happened for you to turn into this dude i think that it was it was always there it oh, just for sure. had some some blinders or it had some shit that was something like that one race when he had it all he needed to do was get like fifth and then he was new york and, I think. and he was at the back and he, you're like something's wrong and he just totally like brain fart and like like a mental midget moment almost, you know, like to where he just put like he was riding in 12th and kind of getting past and wait, crap, I, I want to be conservative, but I, he wasn't focused. Now I th- something probably just clicked where he's like, I just got to fucking focus and trust. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because then he was always there, but there was just, you know, huge learning curve of how to race, when to turn it on, when to back off. And I think he was just so capricious with like, all right, now I, I need to back off on this one. Cause I don't want to blow it, but he just completely ruined it rather than just just fucking go for it you know yeah like you crash usually if you're trying to not go your normal speed even trying to go lower yeah you're either gonna you're trying to go too fast or slower yeah just ride ride your pace um so i i'm i think it's gonna be a treat i think i'm really really excited to watch it and obviously hayden um as well uh, to see if he's gonna just mop him up j-law dude (laughs) j-law back Dude, did you arena cross? We're going to an arena cross, one hundred percent this year. Never thought I'd say it. Dude, did you see the his? He put a, Kyle sent me a story, and it's him like I'm not saying like I I, I realized today that I got it, and he's like <laughs> I'm not saying I'm calling I'm taking out Jet or Tomac, come but you know there's gonna be a lot of people that are gonna be bummed. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'm so I'm so happy for him on a personal level. Yeah, you know, like just think about think we about, need him, dude. A hundred percent we do like, and I think that, I don't know whether, I mean, I've been speaking to him for years, like behind the scenes and there would be like a message, a random, that was like one of the craziest days ever when I got a fucking message from J-Law, but like just there'd be this guy that he'd be a ghost, like even reaching out to you, he's a ghost. And I just was like, fuck bro. Like you exist. But I was like, I, I just want to, I wish I could tell you and you believe me that you need to be here and that people still love you and that the sport is better for you and there's money on the table you know like you can make money you can live the life that you want to live like everything that like 
nothing is lost. You, you might, you're not going to win a Supercross championship again, and you're probably not going to win a Supercross race again, but you're fucking J-Law. You're still that guy, and people still want you here. He, he, is, you know? he is the necessary villain or just... But prota- he's like the hero, too. He's the protagonist, like the anti-hero. Yeah, like he, yeah, dude, yeah. He, is every, he is the character we need in the sport. Like no, I don't think anyone's doubting that, even the ones that hate him. But dude, I remember Rhino saying that he on his best day, he's the fastest dude on the planet. Oh, bro! Like at Milestone, I think he was referring to, and he's like, "There's no one faster on on his best day." Like, dude, I want to see that get cultivated again, and I want to see him on a good bike and see what he can do after this much time off. And I mean, might might hurt some feelings, huh, with some other people. But either way it's another story. It's another layer and another element that I just really, really pumped to see, try to like, try to prevail. Do you remember the X games clip of him? There's like this viral clip on the internet. I think we made like a meme shout out to Alex. One of my editors, he makes like the dopest memes. He, uh, he put together this edit of J law at X games. And it was like, there's this one lap dude. And I saw it. Oh, I would give anything to just hit like, just to have six seconds, like just any six seconds of that lap, just give me that for six seconds. Just, I want to feel it. Dude, even one of those corners, like, oh. I, I, dude, I just, even when you load up the truck, I heard Palm say this, dude, like, dude, it's all worth it. Like you, you load up, load up the truck and all the work and then you drive and then you get, you get that one corner oh. and you're like, it's all worth it. It's all worth it. And you're like, dude, to hit a corner like that, like you'd be just the flow that the guy has and like the like when i ride i'm stiff like my upper like i just don't for me it's funny like the best the best i look when i ride is when i feel like i'm goon riding like everything's like exaggerated and Uh so like he has this crazy looseness on a bike that to me i'm just fucking like i'm gripping that son of a bitch and i'm like doing everything for it not to buck me off and it's like you see a guy like J Law in his prime riding, and it's just the flow and the way that the bike comes to him and goes away, and it, there's like a looseness. Jet's got that same thing where it's like he's so loose and supple. Like supple's the word, where it's just like these minor inputs and like how do you have? It's like predicting the future, right? Like he knows ex- hundred percent exactly what is going to happen. And and Rhino says like you need to be dead present. You know, it's like. Kind of like I think I think that they're that far ahead because they they or were that far ahead and currently is because they know exactly what is going to happen. You know, they're I fully agree. Like they jet doesn't need to squeeze the bike as hard because he knows which way it's going to kick before it kicks. And, you know, it's, it's squeezing and all it's kind of more reactive than proactive. And it's dude, it, they are like sorceress, like <laughs> looking into the future. It's so sick. So did you? So is J Law racing only arena cross as of now, or hope in hopes of doing? A I, super- I don't know. I would, dude. Remember Daytona? Yeah, he could do it. Yeah, you know, like he's just that guy. Like I would love so much for him to uh, to do a supercross. Actually, I haven't told him this, but there's definitely like a a wild card available for him at World Supercross too. No so way. like yeah if he ever wanted to do because they have like the teams and stuff yeah like so he fully could have a wild card there so like there's definitely stuff that he could do but he just would need to he'd need to get in shape and he'd have to i don't him riding's never been a problem yeah and i think that that's where like he was just a guy where if yeah it's you the other just, 23 hours of the day right yeah yeah but i mean he's the kind of guy where i think he'd probably ride for like four five six hours a day but it's like try and make him do other shit then no. So I think like probably my guess for the secret to success, I think he's at club MX right now, but it's like the secret to success with J law is like, just have three bikes that he can just ride all day, every day. Once one, once a bike's out of fuel and needs oil, just don't make him wait. Don't make him go. Don't say you should go to the gym and do some strength and don't say eat good. Just fucking give him another bike. <laughs> and then when that one's done, and then just circle back and give him the one that, that you took off him the last time. And then have a race bike that it's like, all right, wherever you want to go, whatever you want to do, wherever you want to race, like go and do it. Yeah. And, and it, we're not as, we don't have as many distractions as we get older. And he's, he's over 30 now, right? So I think he's, 
there's bound to be you can get in your own way no matter where you are but i mean if he's hunkered down at club mx and he's living and breathing it and there's no opportunity to go you know do something dumb or you know nothing good happens after midnight and all yeah that, you know, dude like, for real i think it's uh, like a gremlin like just don't water him after midnight yeah yeah just let like live it and breathe it then and if he doesn't get sick of it and he's like all right like, that's got to be his biggest hurdle right just continuing yeah. and just not not being distracted and uh i fuck man hope that hope that he races uh a couple of ones to get his feet wet but then, yeah daytona that'd be that'd be the perfect goal right to Set, do, get some warm up rounds and then just try to show up and you know blow some minds at Daytona. And the thing is, is it just doesn't matter what he does, what he gets, but just be at the track, mm-hmm. put the fucking three three eight on the track and watch the fans rush to watch practice and just give us the moment. Like you're a hero forever for just like giving us that moment. And dude, the entire world's cheering for the guy and all the dudes like Dunge and Villo and like those guys that had those crazy rivalries. Like I've talked to them all and they just fuck it. They even, they think he's a legend, you know? And it's like, who's dude, like, they raced who's and they, like that? They know how amazing of a talent he is, dude. That guy, like, yeah, you could, you could try to freaking fist fight Villapoto and he's still gonna be like, all right, I still know how fast he was though. And how, like, like, <laughs> yeah. what he was capable of. Well, dude, there's stories of like, I think, because Daytona was always on bike week. Uh-huh. But it still is. And so it's. Oh, really, yeah. He went out till two in the morning oh, or something. Bro. Yeah. Yeah. Razzles, like whatever the place is. Called. Like that is a shit heap. Like <laughs> you just uh, do, talk about nothing good happens at midnight. Yeah. Nothing good happens there. Yeah. Period. Yeah. And it's like, you just went there, owned the place. And everyone's there that year just being like, holy fuck. Like this guy's sort of going to try and race tomorrow. Just fully in public doesn't care just live in the dream and then like that race where he almost beat chad reed in chad reed's prime bro gets second gets on the podium he's like well i can't beat chad reed that guy's my hero and you're just like dude at every level like from getting to the track getting fucked up at the bar probably banged like seven chicks got out of the motorhome at like you know seven in the morning with 40 minutes sleep and then almost wins his first ever 450 race at daytona and then on the podium says i can't beat chad reed that guy's my hero like bro you can't write a better movie script than what that dude actually lived and there's probably some serious guys out there that's like well it doesn't need shit don't win the fuck championship like you can be that guy or you could just be like you know what that's so fucking cool that a dude that had all of that that's how he lived and he had so much fun and we like got to see it yeah i think we've we've been guilty of idolizing people for that as well and like yeah but we did this and did that you know yeah, and yeah. at some point you're like all right I, this is far more important than that extra little accolade from whatever time but too yeah, there's i don't want to give any any names but there's a few like slope star riders and they're not pretty youthful but not uh not extremely young you know because obviously going out wears on you a lot more as you get older but dude there's a few that surprise me that are just like <laughs> dude you were out like I went to bed and then I heard you're out five hours later and then you woke up and you won the race or you qualified first. I admit Mitch won't care if I told this one, but he dude, he was out until, you know, till daylight in Whistler. He shows up at a similar kind of talent, I guess, too, like freak freak on a bike. And so Mitch Ropolato is out till God, whatever hours in the morning gets like 45 minutes sleep, goes up to walks up to slalom gets like one practice run, weeds it into the bushes, goes back to the top, gets his two qualifying. Cause in slalom, you do one on each run and that, you know, just time by yourself. And that's your, your qualities is the combo. And then he go, goes back and sleeps, comes back up for finals and his bracket. So 32 goes against first, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. and he's like, motherfucker, dude, you, like I'm in the first heat. Do you guys, and everyone's watching They're like Mitch Ropalata. And he's like, ah, oh, dude, I qualified 32nd, dude. That sucks. Everyone's like, you qualified first, bro. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, fuck you, man. <laughs> yeah, like, I literally hate you right now. There's, you're just too good, man. Um, yeah, those those are stories that are, that are you know, they're cool. There's a lot more common than what people would think, too. Yeah, but, you'd, uh, but yeah, obviously winning the race is more important. But if you could add on something like that and then, you know, it's uh, 
definitely good storytelling that's for sure oh dude 100 percent. you know what i wanted to say about the jet thing too is there's a couple things of like if you just hang with jet at the track so we just did shot a big red bull thing there the other day and uh, i think it comes out like mid-december i'm fucking stoked for it but we're shooting this thing and the whole day we're at the track and he's like on the bike like we're doing a bunch of bike stuff and it's like he there was not one time where it's like he turned around the bike normally. Yeah, it was like wheelie and like pivoting, did a three sixty. Or I was like, one point, I'm like, oh, well, let's try this with like the whole shot device in. And he's like, cool. And then he just does like the gnarliest fucking race, like wide open race start, just oh, and went like from me to you away, wide open, slam the front brakes on, does this huge stoppy, and clicks his whole shot device in, and then he just oh, whips the bike around, comes back at. And I'm just like, bro, what the fuck are you doing? It's like, just an extension of it, like dexterity through yeah. your freaking tires. I'm like, this isn't okay. <laughs> like what you're doing is like, and like Goggin says, like be uncommon among uncommon men. Like that's him. Yeah. He's so uncommon among even the most uncommon dudes. And it's like, if you spend a day watching him, not even train, not even just be on a bike. Like the things that he can do and that's talent at work. But that's like, how many times has that kid looped out? Like I've looped out a bike once doing a wheelie. And then I was like, well, that's enough for me. <laughs> like, I'm just not going to be that guy. He's probably broken 3 million fenders. His dad's probably straightened his handlebars 5,000 times. You know, it's like he got to be that guy by being that guy. Just and not caring what people think of like, oh, there's kooks on the ground again. Or yeah, like, yeah just to just keep going like i look at nigel like that too dude yeah. he eats he eats shit so hard and then just nope this is what i'm supposed to be doing and brandon too brandon doesn't like to show his his crashes very much uh Seminuk, but i fucking that, love that dude that dude hits has hit the ground so damn hard and not like hey look at me what i came back from he tries to like, not, not even not, show not it. show his crashes but i've watched him get knocked out and then the filmers be like Dude, you're uh, you're we're, you're done. You're showing you're showing signs of a concussion. You know, we're we're gonna wrap this film. He's like, all right, we're well, gonna come back in like a week or something because I'm gonna do this whether you're here or not. And I just like, like, because I've I've known him for a long time, but I don't have as many of those like you know closer experiences with. But dude, like I love the the grit to not be self conscious. Yeah, and like, yeah. And so Jet to just be probably just laying it down and being a being a little shithead at the track and everyone's annoyed with it but then that of not being self-conscious of it and just doing it over and over again has provided you know better feel on the bike for when it matters but then also just some really cool shit that probably keeps him going throughout the day it probably yeah. keeps him happier when he when he's lining up and doing his practice laps and it's going to make for a, a much more sustainable career of keeping it as fun as possible oh 100 percent. and the other thing to like back your point before about the eli jet thing he wants it so bad yeah he wants to race eli and like that to me is, you know like i'd go back to my competitive like my own competitiveness and i'd be like looking at dudes and like fuck i don't want to fight that guy like that's no nah, i don't want that you know like he's very you have to like override this like negative shit where i'm like gotta tell my or just try and blank that out jet is like this special kind of guy where it's like he wants all the smoke and Deegan's the same. You know, mm -hmm. you talk to Hayden, he's like, fuck, give me anybody. Just give me a dude to be. I want to be. I want him to be the best guy. And that's what Jet is doing coming into this season. He's like, he's so happy that Eli didn't retire. Dude, that's so that's bad, dude. That's psycho. Yeah, that's that's like be the audacity of those <laughs> kids, you know. But dude, yeah. yeah, be audacious, dude. Be like take take him on and just like beating his chest and but it's not even that like he wants to be he his, wants to know he wants to know yeah. if he's that dude yeah you know it's like the world like 22 and oh like the results are saying you're the man and he's like am i the man because tomac's the man and i ain't shit until i like if you want to be the man you got to beat the man and like he knows in his heart and soul that he cannot call himself the best without beating that dude. And That's it's awesome. like, and he has the opportunity, man, if I'm racing and Tomac does his Achilles and it's like, wait, well, I'm, I'm going to my 450 career and I never have to race that psycho. Like I'm breathing a sigh of relief and he's like legitimately disappointed. And I know that 
as a like no cameras around it's not an interview it's like we're just talking about it you know and he's like i'm so happy that he did not retire he's like i just have to race that dude that's the most authentic way you could possibly think right without any sort of you know trying to cut it it yeah it'd be kind of like trying trying to cut a corner or like get get a bonus and you're like all right I, i'll take it i'll take this but he wants to do it and prove yeah to himself and the whole world that's that is going to be probably his biggest strong suit to like i'll take it head on i want it not like all right i'm worried about this i don't know if i can take an advantage here or there i'll take it but he just wants to do it in the hardest way possible yeah it's so sick yeah no it's unreal so but hey i'm gonna let you get to the airport i don't yes. want to be the reason that you missed the flight i fucking loved every minute of this conversation you have an open invite anytime you want to do the podcast yeah i got, yeah, I got a dip <laughs> but this has been awesome i appreciate it yeah thank you and thanks to everyone for watching it looking forward to i think i'm gonna actually try to make it to a1 uh, that'll be the first time the kids have been to a supercross so yeah looking forward to an amazing season and i don't uh i don't think anyone's gonna beat jet and the title but i sure as hell want to see tomac battle him and bring it down to the wire well a1 let's have a ride too let's yeah so, let's, we'll so, i'll sort it out we'll get it we'll get it up all right cheers you're a legend we are excited to announce the launch of our new membership site gypsytales.com packed with exclusive content and perks that you won't find anywhere else this is your chance to become a part of the gypsy gang and as a special bonus, if you sign up to an annual membership, you'll be entered into the draw to win our custom-built TC125 Gypsy Gang.